Okay, so yeah, I'll intro uh, I'm just introducing Tomas Sara from uh, Brown University. So he's he's giving the next talk, and uh, I'll hand it over to you now. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, so th this talk is going to be about trying to uh, understand uh, 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 an interesting uh, visual illusion known as the orientation tilt illusion. And so uh, before I get into the, the, the weeds of my talk, uh, because I don't think everyone here in this audience might necessarily know about uh, the uh, illusion, I wanted to uh, uh, briefly uh, uh, review it. So uh, the perception of a center grading can be uh, drastically altered by uh, it's around. So on the left here would be a vertical grading, which uh, should appear tilted to the left. On the right here is still a vertical grading, but that should appear uh, tilted to the right. Um, the illusion might not be obvious, uh, you know, because some of these effects are uh, frequency and scale dependent. So depending on the size of the stimuli on your screen, it may or may not work. You might have to trust me on this. But here on the upper right corner, our data from O'Toole and Vanderoth uh, that have been replotted. So on the y-axis is the uh, reported perceived shift in orientation from uh, 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 from uh, um, uh, human participants. On the x-axis uh, uh, is the corresponding angular difference between the center and the surround. And so what you see here is that when the angular difference between the center and the surround is small, the surround appears to repulse uh, the center, uh, so tilting it away from uh, the orientation of the surround. Past a critical um, uh, angular difference, the effect reverses, and then the surround appears to attract uh, the center. So a uh, critical question for vision science is whether these effects uh, or this phenomenon uh, reflects a bug uh, of the visual system or rather a feature. And so to give you a, a preview of uh, some of the main conclusions from my talk, uh, I'll try to make the point that uh, this orientation tilt illusion uh, turns out to be a consequence uh, of recurrent mechanisms uh, and circuits that are optimized for the detection of contours. Uh, in the process, I'll uh, uh, describe the work we've done in building a machine learning module, a recurrent neural network module, that is grounded in the anatomy and the physiology of the visual cortex. And we will use that as uh, uh, to ask questions about the role of this uh, 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 recurrent circuits. Uh, and I'll show you that one of the major benefits of uh, such a recurrent neural network module uh, is that on uh, visual tasks and on uh, image segmentation tasks in particular, uh, we're able to uh, get a model that learns, that generalizes much better uh, using much fewer training examples compared to uh, state of the art uh, feed forward neural networks. Uh, and then I'll conclude briefly by showing you uh, that actually on one of the current uh, uh, kind of main challenge in computer vision, which is called the uh, Microsoft Cocoa Panoptic Segmentation uh, Challenge, we're able to, to actually outperform the state of the art with this uh, recurrent neural network approach. So just to, to, to give you some context uh, for why uh, our, our focus on recurrent neural networks, um, if you look at the state of the art in computer vision, whether this is image classification, image segmentation, or action recognition, uh, the progress has been steady for the past uh, several years, uh, but the state of the art is still dominated today by fit for neural networks. Uh, I think part of the part of the the engine driving this progress is actually uh, pretty clear. Uh, this is just a, a snapshot view of what's that, what has been happening on ImageNet. Uh, on the x-axis is the year that the challenge was uh, being held. The height of the bars here correspond to uh, the error rate for that for that year, and you see that the error rate has been decreasing steadily. Uh, at the same time, this red curve shows you that the, the number of uh, layers in the fit forward neural network that won the challenge on that year has been uh, increasing, I would say, almost exponentially. So much of the power of uh, modern GIT neural networks uh, is achieved through kind of uh, static and what I would call brute force depth. Uh, in comparison, if we look at the anatomy and physiology of the visual system, uh, the architecture is somewhat different. Uh, this is a, a view of uh, the site of uh, our monkey brain, uh, the ventral stream of the visual cortex, which is involved in uh, the processing of shape and object information. For almost every feed forward connections, 
in our visual system, uh, we can find a, a reciprocal feedback connections. So if we look at the kind of underlying architecture and, and corresponding models of the ventral stream, in addition to the feedforward connections that are well approximated and, and, and modeled in current uh, feedforward neural networks, our visual system contains local feedback connections. Uh, I'll refer to those connections as horizontal or lateral connections. Um, they will typically run between retinotopically organized units within a layer of processing. Um, and in addition to these horizontal or lateral connections, one can also find uh, what I'll refer to later as top-down connections, so running from a higher stage of processing onto a lower stage of uh, processing. Um, and and uh, case in point, the uh, depths of processing that our visual system is able to achieve is not through this kind of static sheer depth uh, as in fit for a neural network, uh, but rather the backbone of our visual system turns out to be a much shallower uh, neural network where the depth of processing is uh, happening through time through those recurrent kind of connections and an interplay between fit forward, horizontal and top down connections. So my lab has been uh, 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 trying to kind of bridge the gap between uh, what we know about neuroscience and the role of recurrent connections and the reality of computer vision, which is still today dominated by uh, feed-forward neural networks. Uh, and our starting point uh, was a few years ago where we uh, tried to better characterize and understand uh, the recurrent neural circuits uh, that are responsible for the so-called extra-classical receptive field phenomena, which are very well documented uh, uh, electrophysiology phenomena so maybe just to to um, to make it more concrete, I'm sure many of you in the audience are familiar with the notion of classical receptive field, which is uh, the part of the visual field that needs to be uh, stimulated for a particular neuron to elicit a response. Uh, the extra classical receptive field is an area that typically sits right outside of the the receptive field. Um, uh, if one stimulates the extra classical receptive field by itself, it will not elicit any response from the neuron, and that's by definition. Otherwise, it would be part of the classical receptive field. Uh, but it, now, if the if we present something like a full field stimulus, or at least a, a stimulus that uh, uh, covers both the classical and the extra classical receptive field, then it is known and well documented that uh, uh, the extra classical receptive field can uh, strongly modulate the uh, neural response. Uh, it is known that and widely assumed that feedback uh, connections, so both top-down and horizontal connections, uh, play a role in uh, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, classical, extra-classical receptive field um, uh, phenomena. Uh, we build a uh, what I would describe as a uh, computational neuroscience model. It's uh, very uh, uh, closely related to uh, some of the dynamical system models we heard about this morning. Um, our goal was to build a model that would be able to uh, uh, essentially explain and model the interactions between neurons in the visual system, both within a cortical column. So think that maybe within this cortical column, we would have populations of neurons spanning a range of orientation preferences, or maybe a range of um, uh, U preferences, or disparity preferences, or motion preferences. So we're going to have to model the pattern of connectivity within that column, uh, both excitatory and inhibitory, in addition to explaining how this neuron should uh, uh, wire together and connect together, knowing that uh, our visual system is organized retinotopically with those cortical columns, each containing the same basic dictionary of features being replicated across position uh, in space. So I'm not going to tell you very much about this model. This is published, and this is just really a motivation for the for the remaining of this talk. Um, I'll just uh, point out that uh, uh, there are kind of two key uh, parameters in this model, which is this WI and WE, which uh, characterizes the synaptic connectivity within the models. And so we essentially end up with a uh, systems of uh, uh, ordinary differential equations um, and uh, when we present uh, a, a full field stimulus, we end up uh, and potentially model thousands of cortical columns. Uh, we end up uh, with a, a model that includes, uh, you know, on the order of millions of differential equations that need to be solved. So that tends to be a challenge all in all uh, by itself. Um, but my former graduate student, David Melly, uh, was able to essentially figure out how to tweak uh, the pattern of 
uh, inhibition and excitation, again, both within and across cortical column, um, using uh, anatomical and electrophysiological constraints. So you look for all the monkey electrophysiology you could find on uh, this uh, extraclassical receptive field phenomenon. And by tweaking the pattern of synaptic connections, he was able to uh, get a model that would uh, be consistent with uh, the known uh, electrophysiology. And then the main contribution of this work was now uh, to test uh, the underlying uh, circuit with uh, the kinds of uh, 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 contextual illusions that have been uh, studied uh, psychophysically. And what we found is that uh, across visual modalities, uh, we were able to essentially account for a uh, uh, pattern of psychophysics results and the perceived um, uh, uh, perception, the, per the perceived estimates from uh, human subjects uh, during a variety of contextual illusions. So including both the orientation tilt uh, effect that I, uh, uh, where I started from, uh, in addition to color illusions, motion illusions, stereo illusions, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one of the issue, in my opinion, with this uh, kinds of, of uh, um, uh, continuous time dynamics uh, 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 recurrent neural circuits is that I mentioned earlier, uh, they are hard to simulate. And in practice, this means that uh, it becomes uh, uh, tedious and very hard to actually optimize systematically the pattern of connections within these uh, circuits. So we were kind of lucky in this first instantiation because we could use the uh, physiology uh, to constrain the pattern of synaptic connectivity. But in general, if we want to get uh, at the level of understanding uh, the potential role that these uh, uh, recurrent circuits play uh, and, and, and whether those uh, contextual illusions are bugs or features, we would like ideally to optimize this pattern of connectivity so that this circuit could solve almost arbitrary uh, visual recognition tasks. Uh, and so we realized uh, uh, that uh, uh, we were using a very simple uh, method, Euler integration method, to solve these differential equations. And we realized that essentially we were uh, solving these differential equations using uh, you know, discrete time approximations, uh, which could be completely learned and approximated with kind of modern uh, recurrent neural network and deep learning tools. So shown here is an example of the actual unit we use, which is called gated recurrent unit. If you've never heard about gated recurrent units, uh, that's OK. Uh, they are simplified uh, uh, units uh, compared to the uh, LSTM that uh, you heard about uh, this morning. The details are not critical. Uh, the take-home message here really is that uh, we have the tools at the moment from uh, machine learning and deep learning that allow us to essentially approximate uh, uh, these kinds of uh, continuous time uh, uh, um, uh, neural circuits. Uh, and the benefit of building mathematical or machine learning abstractions of those uh, 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 neural circuit models is that now we can essentially take those modules, plug them into our favorite uh, deep neural circuits, and optimize them at scale to solve arbitrary visual tasks. So in order to demonstrate the benefit of these kinds of uh, what I would call highly recurrent neural network uh, modules, that is uh, neural network architectures where neurons are allowed to communicate uh, across uh, neighbors within a layer of processing, as opposed to the feed-forward neural network that can only send information bottom-up. Um, we came up with this uh, task that we call a pathfinder. So I think the best analogy we could come up with would be a task where you'd have to follow uh, you know, uh, some footprints uh, among many other footprints. And so the task was cast as a binary categorization task. On the top row here are examples of positive examples. On the bottom row are negative examples. Um, those uh, images are black and white. Uh, uh, you should see kind of contours made up of paddles. Uh, and then on uh, both sets of images, there are markers that are these white circles. And again, I don't know whether you, you can see this uh, at home. Um, but the main difference is that on the positive set, the two markers uh, fall in the same contour. So there is a path uh, linking the two markers. There is no path or the two markers are on different contours on the negative set. We never give the rule to the neural network, obviously. They learn, they have to discover uh, the rule uh, by uh, uh, learning from, from, from examples. Um, our hypothesis here was that uh, our uh, recurrent neural network uh, would be solving the task by uh, incrementally grouping neighbors, by passing information across neighbors. Um, fit for neural network are universal approximators, so we knew that, in theory, they should be able to solve the task uh, perfectly well. 
uh, if we have enough uh, training examples. But our prediction was that the way they would solve this task would be by building receptive fields that uh, encompass the entire contour. And so our prediction was that as we make the contours longer and longer, from say six paddles to nine paddles to 14 paddles, our expectation was that uh, the, uh, the minimal architecture, the minimal fit for neural network capable to solve the task should get deeper and deeper uh, because that's the way uh, 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 deep neural network uh, uh, grow their receptive fields. Um, and so that's a prediction that we tested. So there is a, a, a lot of information on this uh, figure, and that reflects the fact that uh, our reviewers wanted a lot of controls and for us to test every possible architecture. Uh, uh, but I think to some extent, I'm uh, going to draw your attention to the top row here. Um, uh, what you see here on the in red, uh, accuracy on the y-axis, and then we have the accuracy over different past lengths. Our recurrent neural network, uh, which we called age grew, as in horizontal grew, can mm -hmm. learn the task uh, at all contour lengths perfectly. Uh, so there is no effect of contour lengths on the performance of the network. Um, I'll skip through a number of, of, of controls here. I'll bring your attention here to the ResNet, which is considered a uh, uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, neural network. For sh small, short contours, we find that uh, ResNet 1850 uh, can solve the task. However, for the longest contour, 14, we had to go all the way to 152 layers of processing to solve what would seem to be an otherwise kind of trivial uh, uh, visual task. So if we replot this data, uh, where here uh, on the x-axis is the uh, essentially the percent multiplier uh, so the, uh, uh, the number of parameters uh, multipliers compared to our uh, baseline architecture, which is the edge group. So here we have perfect accuracy with a multiplier of one. Uh, you can get also very good accuracy with feed forward neural network, but you, as I said earlier, we need to get all the way to 152 layers of uh, processing, which leads to a thousand times more free parameters to be fitted. Uh, which in practice means a network that will require many more training examples to learn uh, as well. All right, uh, so uh, what we've done since is to continue kind of uh, uh, extending and building up our uh, uh, recurrent neural circuits. We started with a model of the horizontal connections. We have seen extended the module to allow for top-down connections. We have also devised tasks that would allow us to uh, 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 demonstrate a double differentiation between the role of horizontal and top-down connections, depending on the task. And I'm not going to tell you anything about it, but if there are uh, people in the audience interested in the details, this was published again this year at iClear. Uh, uh, what I'm going to tell you about today is the fact that now, again, we have a hierarchy of uh, uh, processing stages, and we're going to be training this uh, recurrent neural network for the detection of contours uh, on the Berkeley image segmentation data sets. So I should uh, point out from the beginning that uh, the level of accuracy of the state of the art uh, on this Berkeley data set is already human level. Uh, and I should also point out that the state of the art on this data set are fit forward, very deep fit forward neural network. Uh, this is called BDCN here. Uh, and without dwelling too much on the details, I should say that uh, the state of the art is obtained and human level of accuracy is obtained through a lot of uh, uh, bells and whistle and a lot of uh, massaging to be able to train this neural network. So typically they are pre-trained on ImageNet for image categorization. They are further fine-tuned on a different data set that has only coarse uh, uh, contour information. And then they are further fine-tuned on this Berkeley segmentation data set. But because the data set is too small, both the training and the validation sets are used. So it's, it's a lot of data and training messaging. Uh, our recurrent neural network is able to also achieve uh, human level of accuracy when we do all of this complicated kind of training procedure. But what is more interesting, I think, is what happens when we start uh, cutting down on the number of training examples used by those uh, feed forward and, and, and recurrent neural architectures. What you can see here is that if we remove uh, uh, some of the data augmentation, which are some of the tricks used to get this uh, very deep feed forward network to train at all, so using the entire set of images, but no, no augmentation, we get a big drop uh, from human accuracy. Uh, our recurrent neural network, GammaNet, also get a drop, but it's uh, much less so. And in particular, you see that here, our GammaNet is able to achieve the same level of accuracy as the uh, very deep feed for neural network. Uh, 
uh, that would have been using or being trained with 100% of the training data, uh, where now the the fit for the sorry excuse me the recurrent neural network was trained with only uh, one tenth of that, so 10% of the data. So the partial conclusion here is that uh, one of the benefits of these recurrent neural circuits is to be able to achieve at least equivalent uh, uh, robustness and generalization while cutting down the sample complexity. So that is being much more sample efficient than their fit forward counterparts. And to illustrate uh, uh, kind of the, the difference on how this uh, recurrent neural network uh, solved the task compared to fit forward neural network, uh, here is, uh, so these are different images. Uh, at equal one, uh, the network uh, uh, produces an initial uh, 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 set of predictions for the presence of contours. It's very noisy. There are many uh, contours that are missing. There are many spurious ones, but through time, dynamically through the exchange of information through recurrent connection, um, the network is able to fill in the missing information. So filling in missing contours and then suppressing kind of spurious contours. And you see that at times T equal uh, eight here, we're able to get a final prediction from the network that is a fairly good approximation of the ground truth that is derived from uh, human subjects. Now, uh, going back to our original question about the role uh, and whether uh, 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 the tilt illusion is a bug or a feature, um, I should point out that uh, so we run the same psychophysics experiment on this uh, 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 recurrent neural network optimized for control detection. We find a qualitatively good fit uh, with human data. I should uh, point out that the effect is actually much stronger uh, in the record in the model than it is on humans it's one order of magnitude larger but in, interestingly the fit for neural network does not exhibit uh, any uh, effect at all uh, despite the fact that those two architecture perform at the same level of accuracy actually all three here would be human gamma net and bdcn would be achieving the same level of accuracy uh, on uh, control detection so this leads us to believe that one recurrent mechanisms are uh, necessary and sufficient to account for uh, the tilt illusion. Uh, and two, the tilt illusion appears to arise as a byproduct of a circuit that is optimized for control detection. And I'm going to skip this because I'm going to uh, run out of time. Uh, I'll just say that uh, we found a way to um, uh, correct for the illusion. Uh, and we find that if we do this, two things happen. One, the accuracy of the recurrent neural network drop. So the contextual, the, the tilt illusion is really not a bug. It's a, something that, uh, that is part of the inherent computation carried by the system. And that seems to be optimal for uh, control detection. I want to briefly uh, uh, give you an update on, on, on this work. Uh, our current effort is in trying to continue scaling up uh, uh, our uh, uh, recurrent neural network architecture, and in particular to demonstrate their benefit on uh, compared to fit forward neural network on uh, what are uh, considered to be uh, the very kind of large scale computer vision challenges. So here's an example of such a uh, large cage, large scale, excuse me, uh, computer vision challenge. This is called the Microsoft Coco Panop Panoptic Segmentation Challenge. Uh, here, the idea is for the system to uh, classify every pixel, to output a class label uh, for every pixel. Uh, this would be segment semantic segmentation. Not only that, but when there are multiple objects, sometimes occluding each other or at least being in close proximity, the system cannot just have a single kind of class label for the entire group, but the individual objects, the different instances, have to be segmented out. So this is a very hard task. Uh, the measure used to evaluate progress is this panoptic quality uh, measure. Uh, the state of the art is in the uh, uh, lower 40%. Um, and uh, this is the current state of the art, a version of a ResNet, which uh, I'm not going to tell you much about. I'll just say that compared to our recurrent neural network, it contains about a million uh, extra parameters. Uh, all we did here was to add our recurrent neural network module on top of this fit forward neural network. With just one iteration, one uh, recurrent step, we can already get a, a, a substantial gain in accuracy. And then as we increase more and more steps, uh, we start uh, seeing uh, improvements. Now, I should point out that uh, one of the initial limitations we had with uh, training those recurrent neural network at scale on very large computer vision data sets was the fact that uh, the backpropagation through time, which is one of the main 
uh, methods used to train this recurrent neural network uh, does not do well uh, with memory. That is, if we wanted a system that has a lot of time steps, we would need more and more GPU memory in order to train this network, which given that we are starting from relatively deep networks already, uh, this prevents, this seriously limits uh, how much uh, uh, kind of recurrent time steps we can actually uh, uh, compute. Uh, we came up with a, uh, an extension of the backpropagation through time. Uh, again, I'm not going to tell you the details. I'll just say that it works. When we use our uh, uh, extension, we find that now we can uh, train the network with an arbitrary number of time steps because we are not, 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 not anymore bound by uh, the GPU memory, and that we're able to get uh, uh, significantly improved results with 20 steps uh, of processing. So just to give you a, a qualitative sense for the, 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 the gap here between the feedforward network and the recurrent neural network, um, I'll show you here just two examples. On the left are the feedforward networks, right is our recurrent neural network. The colors of the pixels here correspond to the predictions of those models. You see that the feedforward networks here makes a hallucinates a sheep uh, in the rocks. It hallucinates here a zebra uh, in the wagon. And these are the kind of spurious detections that uh, a recurrent neural network is able to suppress. I'll just uh, show you qualitative results on this uh, COCO segmentation data set. You see that the network behaves very differently from uh, those feedforward, uh, hierarchical, uh, very deep uh, neural network where processing would be done through static depth. Here, the network seems to uh, learn, and this is not something we have coded in the network, it learned that as a strategy. Uh, I would call this strategy a filling in strategy. The network starts with uh, an initial seed on the object somewhere in the center, and then the information gets propagated until the entire object mask has been uh, filled in. All right, I'm already at 25 minutes, so uh, before I conclude, I uh, I just wanna, I'm aware that the, the workshop really is uh, 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 for, as, a, as a health uh, component to it. Uh, and I wanted to emphasize the fact that um, uh, the approach we've taken to go from this uh, uh, neural circuit models, uh, uh, recurrent circuit models to deep neural uh, network modules that are trainable and optimizable from data uh, uh, can be broadly applied uh, well outside of vision. And so uh, case in point, uh, we are part of uh, a large-scale DARPA project which aims at uh, restoring um, and, and trying to, uh, uh, um, restoring movement in patients that have had a spinal cord injury. Uh, we have colleagues uh, who are developing electrodes that uh, can be implanted above and below the injury site. Those electrodes can simultaneously record and stimulate uh, directly the spinal cord. Our goal is to build a smart interface that would enable uh, uh, learning architecture to learn to, recogn to, to reconnect the two sites. In general, you could do that with a black box, very deep fit for a neural network or black box, fully recurrent, um, recurrent neural network. After all, those are universal approximators and they can learn anything in the limit of uh, a large amount of training data. Uh, our approach has been different. Our approach has been that uh, we think that if we, if we approximate uh, uh, the circuits that we are trying to, 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 to bypass here uh, will fare better. And so we have uh, been able to apply this exact method starting from a biophysical model of the spinal cord, uh, essentially starting from a wiring diagram and then building a uh, machine learning approximation where finding that the underlying uh, interface learns much more efficiently than a generic kind of black box type of uh, interfaces. I'm way out of time, so I'm just gonna leave this slide uh, while I take questions. Uh, I want to thank Drew Linsley and Rex Liu, who are fantastic postdoc in the lab. Junkyun Kim, who is now at uh, DeepMind and was a former grad student of mine. Lakshmi Govindarajan, current uh, grad student, and Alec Ashok, who is a wonderful uh, research assistant. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much. That was very interesting. Um, so I have uh, one question so far from the audience, and that is, uh, whether you could also model, model higher, higher level feedback for attention or saccades from frontal eye field using modifications of the approach that you took? Uh, this is exactly, so we haven't done it yet, but this is, uh, the, uh, uh, this is exactly the thesis uh, uh, topic of one of my graduate students. So I completely agree. The next step is to incorporate uh, attentional mechanisms uh, uh, and allowing, if not uh, saccadic eye movements, at least, uh, 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 being able to model um, uh, shift of attention, absolutely. 
And uh, is it possible to measure the kind of temporal dynamics you see in the more the biophysical kinds of models using your networks? To, to I'm sorry, so I'm not sure if you understand. So to measure the by the the. The, the spiking dynamic is that there's no spiking, but the kind of no. So this dynamics. is yeah. So to be clear, and I, I probably was not clear enough, uh, we are starting from uh, rate-based models. So kind of uh, there is no spike here. Uh, but I think in general, uh, again, the approach shouldn't be limited to just uh, rate-based model. And in fact, I think it would be interesting to uh, to to try to expand towards uh, spikes. Um, I'll just I'll just. Uh, uh, share one of my provoking uh, views to this to this crowd i don't think spikes will be very useful for ai um, uh, i do think however that obviously they are important for characterizing uh, mechanisms of the visuals of, of the brain and, and circuits of the brain so it, it would be interesting uh, to uh, try to leverage some of those tools to build uh, kind of machine learning approximations thanks uh, okay oh there's one more question just quickly, if you've looked for other visual illusions. So uh, we are in the process of, you know, this, so we have, uh, so the original model that was not trained or optimized, that was kind of uh, tweaked with graduate student descent. Uh, so this is a psych review paper from 2018. And there we have a uh, uh, N-tune model. And that we found that it was able to explain uh, a host of contextual illusions. So I've shown you the orientation tilt illusion. We have both color, uh, contrast and color assimilation. We have related illusions in the motion domain and in the disparity domain. Um, right now, we have only been able to optimize these circuits on contour detection. Uh, we are trying to extend. Uh, so I suspect that uh, those illusions uh, in color, uh, motion, and disparity uh, reflect uh, uh, are the byproduct of. Uh, recurrent circuits that are normally optimized for other kinds of tasks. So I think uh, color induction is a byproduct of color constancy, for instance. And so I have a graduate student who is uh, optimizing and training the network on kind of color constancy computer vision databases and should be able to report on that soon. Uh, and similarly with motion and stereo, it's a matter of figuring out what task uh, to use to optimize the circuit uh, in order to account for the, for the phenomena. All right, so our next talk uh, will be Terry Sanyavsky, Salk Institute and UCSD, who will talk on strong inhibition and stable temporal dynamics in spiking networks sustain working memory. Let's see, Thomas, you'll stop sharing and then we should be able to get Terry on somehow. Okay, I invited Terry now. Oh, here we go. Share screen. All right. So I have. I pressed share screen. Application window. Ah, okay. Here and share. And here we go. Can you see that? Yes, I see it and I hear you. Okay, you are looking out over the Pacific Ocean and um, uh, very, I, I really have enjoyed a lot of the talks here. And in fact, uh, I couldn't have asked for a better talk to precede mine because it's, it's going to make a point that, uh, a, a major point that I, I want to make. Uh, and, and, and it has to do with how you go about modeling. It's a whole new approach. Um, and uh, the, 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 the real focus here is going to be on working memory and developing models, network models of working memory. And specifically spiking models of, of uh, working memory. Uh, <clears throat> now the, the point, uh, the, the bigger point here has to do with uh, the use of these really powerful modern tools that have come out of machine learning. And uh, Thomas really used them very, very powerfully 
to uh, explore the, the visual system. Uh, and I've written a book about this called The Deep Learning Revolution. It's a, a trade book for a general audience. And uh, the, the real punchline is the tagline at the top, which is artificial intelligence meets human intelligence. And there is a convergence going on now between these two fields as neuroscience has better tools and techniques for understanding neural circuits. And as uh, the tools for analyzing data uh, from machine learning get better and better, and, and we can now take these tools and understand better uh, how brains function. Uh, now, uh, you can buy this book from Amazon for $22, or you can go to uh, PNAS, uh, just Google uh, Sanofsky and PNAS. Uh, there is an article there on the, uh, it's a kind of a Cliff's Notes of the book on the unreasonable effectiveness of deep learning and artificial intelligence. And it really was, was aimed at a scientific audience and specifically the issues of what's underlying the power of mathematical reasoning, mathematical underpinning of deep learning is really the, the focus. And it has to do with the proper mathematical properties of high dimensional spaces, which is counterintuitive. Okay. so. Uh, if you go back in the literature, there are a lot of models for working memory. And one of my favorites uh, is the recurrent network model. Uh, this is from a review paper. And uh, Dan Daniel Durstovitz, who gave a really nice talk earlier as one of the co-authors, he was a postdoc in the lab back in the about the you know, two, 2000s. Um, but you know, it, it's it's a very simple model and it's very appealing. The idea is you have a very highly recurrently connected uh, groups of pyramidal cells, and if you analyze it, uh, you can analyze it uh, mathematically. You can also simulate uh, spiking neurons, and and you, what you see here on the right is uh, uh, Jerry, your slides are slightly off the screen. I don't know if there's anything you can do about that. Oh, okay. It's like they're too big, and they're off on the bottom and the right. Okay. Well, I am going to go off piece and see if we can enlarge them here. Uh, let's see. Let's go to full screen. Oh, that doesn't work. No, I do want to close video. I don't know why that happened. Uh, for some reason, you are screen sharing. Close to click the close message. Okay. Uh, it, let's try that again. First, let me go to here and enlarge it. Sorry about this. I should have done a little bit of testing earlier. I take it you're not seeing anything right now because I'm not sure. Just, just your face, yeah. Oh, you see my face. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah it's probably you can probably go back to the way it was. If it, that it was mostly sure. there, uh, I, <laughs> I didn't I, know it would be this. I think we can speak a little now. better. I think uh, if I can just tune this up a little bit. Now, can you see that? Uh, no, I don't think you're sharing. At least at the moment. I'm not sharing? Oh, okay. Then I must share again. Okay, how's that? Okay, now I see. I see it as a little, uh, there it comes. I mean, now we have the full screen. Uh, but it's in a non-presentation mode. It's, it's okay. Either yeah, that's, that's I, I, know, I think we can handle that'll that. That'll work. Okay. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so as, this is a, a very well-studied recurrent network. It's it's really a hot field network, but, and it has two stable for a given input. It has it can have two stable states: one when a lot of units are active, and one when they're not. Uh, and uh, Xiao Jing did some nice work showing that. Uh, it, it's a stable 
uh, you can st st stably store a, a, uh, an activity uh, if the synaptic time constants are long, uh, namely NMDA receptors. So, so, th so this is a, a very common way of going about a network, building a network model. You have an idea, maybe if you connected up the connectivity in a certain way and you fiddle with the parameters, you'll eventually get it to do something. And, and we've taken that a long way, but the question is, can, can we come up with new ideas uh, that maybe we didn't have for connecting up the network? And that's why these learning algorithms have proven to be so, I think, important. So uh, a lot of work was done over the last uh, decade or two on uh, training up recurrent neural networks. And we've heard about uh, s some of the exciting work that's being done with the recurrent networks, uh, back propagation through time. Um, and, uh, and so he he here's, the here's the traditional model where we have uh, a activity, we have an input, uh, so we have input connections, we have recurrent connections and we have output connections and you can train it to uh, do an uh, arbitrary input output mapping. Now, what we're gonna be focused on here is to try to transfer one of these uh, recurrent networks that was trained up on a particular task to a spiking network. Um, and, and, and here's how we did it. This was published in, in PNAS in 2019. And a lot of people have tried to uh, make progress with this. And it turns out that there's a very, very simple way to, to, uh, to do this. And, and it's a one for one substitution. You don't have to multiply the number of units to average out the noise from the spikes. What you do is you train up the recurrent network as shown here. And this is a very simple task, which is uh, simply to uh, integrate the, uh, the pulse coming in uh, up to, uh, as you can see uh, here, um, up, to, up to the output. And if there's no pulse, no output. So it just uh, detects an input by integrating the, uh, the pulse. So you train that up. And now what you do is uh, one for one, you have uh, the, the network, but the connections have to be scaled. And the connection strengths of the recurrent connections and the outputs have to be scaled by lambda. Now, the performance of the, of the uh, uh, integrate and fire network is shown below it with lambda equal one, which is what everyone was using. And you can see that it fails miserably. It, it, it should be, uh, the, the correct output should be zero or one. But if you scale it down by a factor of 50, it performs almost as well as the recurrent network, as you can see here. And here's uh, some activity patterns. And so you can see it is, it's, qu it's quite feasible. And, and this works almost all the time, uh, depending on the difficulty of the task to be able to transfer. So we have a way of creating spiking networks now using the, uh, the, the full power of uh, training of arbitrary uh, rate uh, based neural networks. So now, okay, let's have put in a delay task. This is a, a tr temporal XOR task. And the idea is we have two different inputs, a first stimulus uh, separated in time by a second stimulus on, on, on the order of uh, half a second. And if they're both the same up or, or down, uh, you want the output to be one. But if they're different, you want the output to be minus one. And now XOR is a really trivial problem. It was one of the first that was used for uh, back propagation. You, you, you know, it, 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 but, but what makes this difficult is that there's a time delay. And so somehow the uh, network has to hold on to the information from the first stimulus in order to decide what to do for the second. Now, the other thing I have to tell you is that not, not only can you train uh, with backprop the, uh, the weights, you can also train intrinsic properties. And, and we in fact had each of the synaptic uh, inputs of uh, train the delay. So here's a distribution of the learn parameters for the delay. Uh, and so you can go in now and look with principal components to see how the, the task was solved. And so on the first input, the green one here, you can see starting from uh, the, the starting point here uh, in the center, uh, depending on whether it goes up or down, uh, the trajectory of the internal dynamic goes to the left or the right. And then when the second one comes in, uh, you, you get the bifurcation again and the, uh, the decision. So this is great. So this is a good starting point. But now let's compare it to neural data. So the data set that we looked at was recordings from the prefrontal cortex. Uh, and uh, this is monkey uh, data. Constantine it is, uh, has a, a repository where you can go and get a very large data set, uh, something like uh, 400 cortical 
uh, prefrontal cortical neurons. And uh, the delay match of sample task is, is relatively simple, but it re requires a delay. And the idea is that you fixate, uh, a cue comes on on the left or the right, and you have to basically decide whether it's the same side or not by saccading. And so here are recordings from 150 neurons showing uh, what's happening during the match versus the non-match. It's difficult to make any sense out of this, but the fact is that there's information here that we're going to extract. We rep reproduced exactly the same task now with our recurrent network, uh, delayed match to sample. Uh, here's the raster plot. And so again, it, just by looking at the, the rasters, you're not going to really understand what's going on in the network, but we can dissect out what's going on. Uh, with Now the first analysis that we did both on the neural data and on the uh, the network data was to look at the uh, with the autocorrelation. Uh, and we did that by, first of all, binning 50 millisecond bins and then counting them for each trial, that's 50 trials, counting the number of spikes per bin. And basically with that bin size, it's only zero, one or two. Uh, and then we cross-correlated, autocorrelated the bins with different delays. And you can see that uh, the time constant for the decay of an averaging, of course, autocorrelation over the entire uh, one second uh, range here. But you can see that for these uh, for spikes that it falls off uh, after about 170 milliseconds uh, with, with the uh, exponential decay. So here's comparing now that this analysis uh, of, of the uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex with the trained neural network um, and, and you can see that uh, they have a similar, uh, uh, in terms of the uh, time constants, uh, similar uh, distribution uh, compared to the on-train network, uh, which has a very low time constant uh, for autocorrelation. So the, the learning did create this internal uh, state where it was able to hold on to the information over hundreds of milliseconds. And if you separate out uh, those that are below the median with uh, comparing it to the, uh, for, for the dorsal lateral versus the recurrent, they're quite similar uh, in, on the order of 70 milliseconds for the short and then about 130 milliseconds for the long. So we, we think we actually have a pretty good handle on the, the distribution. And now we can do, you can go even further. We can go into, because of the fact that it's very hard to go into the prefrontal cortex and figure out what the circuit is, uh, we, for, we have complete control and complete analysis. It's not a black box. We've, we've created this recurrent network and we can we have complete knowledge of uh, the inputs, the activity patterns, the, the synapses. And so now we can go in and actually uh, interrogate and, and find out what the circuit mechanism was. Uh, so, so first of all, let's look for, uh, we need a measure and we're gonna use something called discriminability and here's how it works. What we're going to do is uh, look at the, uh, and this has been used to analyze neural data as well. So we're going to be showing you both neural data and uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex on the top and uh, recurrent network in the bottom. So the idea is uh, during, say, the queue and delay periods, can you predict just by doing a, 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 a regression from the activity pattern, can you predict what, what the first input is? Is it up or down? And the answer is that if you do that, there's a lot of information in the DLP, uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex of the, of the you know, units that we're uh, using for, and, and also during the delay period. So that's a, a really good indicator of that somehow in the activity pattern, it was preserving the input. And the same thing is true here, as you can see, where uh, th there's, there's a lot of information here, uh, both during the queue and delay period. Uh, now, uh, we wanted to compare this delay period with another network that didn't have any delay period. And so here's another task, alternative force choice. You give it a cue and the output has to go up if it's up or down if it's down. And it solved the task and uh, the time scale was much lower. You don't, you don't need long time scales. But now what we're gonna do is uh, with these, uh, we have these two tasks. Uh, we notice that the inhibitory strength is a lot less. The average inhibitory strength is about 50% greater in the network trained to do the 
match the sample, delayed match the sample. So we went in and, and we scrambled the, uh, the, the weights between the inhibitory neurons and uh, the time scale for the DMS goes way down. Whereas if you scramble the excitatory weights, uh, it, it, it doesn't actually change uh, them at all, the time scale at all. So clearly implicating the inhibitory neurons here somehow. And, and so, uh, you know, the, the second penny fell when we analyzed the inputs to the inhibitory neurons. It turns out that they fell into two groups. Uh, the, these are uh, selectivity of, of, uh, from the two input. Uh, there were some that responded well to the positive cues and others to the negative cues. So there's two subgroups, subsets of inhibitory neurons that have both, uh, that have both uh, recurrent inhibitory inputs uh, uh, amongst themselves, each group, and also between. And, and you can see that the strength is greater between than within, and the number of connections is also larger of within. By the way, some very important issue. Uh, we we used uh, the the architectural constraint that we had 80% excitatory neurons in model in the model and 20% inhibitory. The more constraints you put in, the, the better the match is going to be to the data. Uh, and then uh, the, the when we when we varied uh, the uh, the strengths of those inhibitory connections, we can see that uh, increasing the strength of the connections between inhibitory groups increase the accuracy and increasing the inhibitory strengths within a group decrease the accuracy significantly. So it's clear that there's some interaction occurring between these two groups. And so here is our model that we've extracted from that, that uh, the delay match a sample network. So the input comes in and depending on whether it's up or down, uh, one or the other of the inhibitory groups is going to turn on. And because of there's mutual inhibition, it's going to turn off the other inhibitory group. Now, these inhibitory neurons are connected to a bunch of excitatory neurons. And uh, if the inhibitory neuron pool is on, it turns off uh, one pool of excitatory neurons, but this one is disinhibited. So you have output coming in through disinhibition on one set of excitatory units that will be maintained during the delay period, as you can see here. In fact, the firing rate goes up. So this suggests a completely different model for how you could implement working memory through pools of inhibitory neurons that are inhibiting each other. Interestingly, this very same model has been used for uh, dev devising by hand small networks that can make decisions, decision making. Uh, and so there, there's an interesting convergence here. That is to say, there's a motif here that can do both things, can make both do the decisions and remember things. Um, now here's one last thing, uh, uh, not the last thing, but uh, in terms of uh, extracting out some uh, in interesting additional information about the biology. Here's a task where uh, there's a contact signal that tells you whether you should integrate uh, the, the green input or the, the, the red input. And, um, and so uh, you trained it up um, and, and there's no problem doing that. But now the question is, if you start with a network that was trained for some other task and you are only able to change the input weights, can you still do the task? Okay, so here are two networks that we trained up, one on the alternative force choice and the other one on the delay match of sample. We took it and then we retrained and we can see that it can do this. Both networks were able to retrain and do the, the task equally well. Okay, so let's do another transfer task. Let's try to uh, train up on alternative force choice. Uh, and, and now we're going to uh, see whether we can do a, a delayed match to sample. This is actually a non-match to sample. And we can see here that we, if we have uh, the normal eye to eye, uh, it basically is at 50%, which means it's a chance. It, you can strengthen it and, and get some performance up to about 60%. So what that suggests is that the, the strength of the inhibition actually is important. Now, if you start with the delayed match to sample, right? And so we have long correlation times, long uh, uh, the decay times, then uh, there's no problem training it up on the delayed match of sample. We get up to 100% uh, on most of the trials pretty quickly. So this, this suggests something. It suggests that if you start out 
may be innately with this, these long uh, correlation times in between the inhibitory neurons now, for the, this mechanism, that, uh, that you, you could basically handle a lot of tasks by just changing the input weights. And, and the question is whether there's any evidence for that. Uh, uh, well, first of all, we have data, it turns out, from the monkeys uh, in the pre-trial period. What they did is before they trained the monkey, they gave it the same input, but it, the task was just to maintain fixation. So this is a way for getting out information about the, uh, the, the, the strengths, the, 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 the long time constants. And we can see here that the time constant for the monkey for this passive task was had the same distribution as for the monkey after it was trained on a delayed match to sample. Now, going further, there's uh, evidence in literature that the uh, ratio of different inhibitory neurons varies from the posterior somatosensory cortex up here to the prefrontal cortex here on the left. And what you're seeing here is, first of all, parvalbumin density, as you can see, uh, is, is very high. It, it increases going down. It's very high for primary visual and somatosensory areas, but is relatively low up in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, th this is actually a mouse, so this is uh, infralimbic, and, uh, and and this is the insular, agranular insular up here at the very top. Uh, and now what we can do is look at the somatostatin, the ratio of palvarbumin to somatostatin. So this is just a ratio now. We can see that, uh, that uh, over 80% of the inhibitory cells now are, uh, the a fraction of the inhibitory cells are uh, somatostatin compared to palvalbumin. So it looks as if the somatostatin cells may be the ones that are doing this, uh, 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 you know, subpopulations that are inhibiting each other, which is interesting. Uh, and that's a testable prediction. And I would have never guessed this if no one had ever told me this. Finally, and this is a really exciting because this is a, another thing that can be tested, which is that uh, there's, a, if you look at the trial, trial variability, uh, it's, it's different uh, depending on where you are in, in the cortex and also in the recurrent network. So uh, here's a, a case where there is uh, low variability on each of the trials, there's like two or three, one, two, three spikes. But with high variability, you get some trials where there's like six uh, spikes and others where there's none or one. And uh, if you do an autocorrelation, you can pick that up very easily. So here's the uh, the density, uh, and we computed the FANO factor, which is a measure of uh, variability. And you can see in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, there, there's a, a, a long tail here uh, where the FANO factor is higher, and there's more short uh, a, a small family factor suggesting that it's low variability, relatively low variability in, uh, for, for the, the short ones. Uh, but here in the recurrent network, we have the same trend, namely for the, uh, the long variability, the, the long, this is the long time constants, I should say, the long time constants have higher variability uh, than, than the uh, shorter time constants. Uh, so we have the same trend. So it looks as if in addition to uh, this prediction, we, we predict that whatever, with the subset of interneurons that are responsible for the delay period activity will have high FAMO factor. And indeed, uh, this is what's seen in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex data uh, comparing to the recurrent network data. The longer the time scale, uh, the higher the FAMO factor. So th this, all these pieces of evidence are pointing in the same direction. And so finally, uh, you know, you, you can do a lot of things. You can, uh, for example, scramble the connections. Uh, and the only, uh, it, this is now uh, showing that uh, if you uh, increase the connect, connect strength of the connectivity, uh, the FANO factor increases in our recurrent network. Again, showing that it's the strength of the inhibition that seems to be controlling things between the subgroups. And, and here's, uh, again, varying between minus 30 and 30 and showing this strong relationship. So this is another measure, FANO factor. So finally, let me just wrap this up and say that uh, we have a big, I think, a strong hypothesis now. We have another uh, model that might be a contender for a very important function in the 
especially in the prefrontal cortex, which we, we know is important for delay period uh, activity and for short-term memory. Uh, we've been focusing here uh, on the, the synapses and the neurons and the networks. I should say that this method can be used to train up not just uh, the time constants, uh, but also many intrinsic properties like uh, membrane, time constant, uh, excitability, and so forth. So we can, by putting in more constraints and putting in more parameters, we can actually look for how each one of them are, are going to contribute to the, the, the performance. But I also should let you know very briefly that we have another paper that's in review in Neuron in which we can show that you don't even need the recurrent, the, the rate-coded network uh, because we found a way to train up spiking networks uh, and, and, and not only the synaptic strengths, but also the intrinsic properties. And with that, I will say that the, uh, the student who did this work, Robert Kim, uh, is an MD, PhD student, extraordinarily uh, talented, both in terms of doing these recurrent network models, but uh, the other half of his thesis was, thesis was on analyzing mismatch negativity data from schizophrenia patients. Uh, and so uh, he's a, a, a double threat. And with that, I will say goodbye. Four quick questions. Thank you, Terry. Excellent uh, talk, as always. Uh, I think we had a question from Sam. Did you want to ask something? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that was very interesting to hear about the interneuron role to working memory. So uh, I was curious what you thought about related work that was looking at prefrontal cortex slices where they found that blocking the HCN channel, the hyperpolarization activated channels would uh, block these kind of persistent graded firing in response to stimuli. Okay, well, uh, that is uh, something we have not put in the model yet, but I will predict that in fact, you know, with the hyperpolarizing activated current with inhibition like that, you're, it's definitely gonna play a role. So uh, we'll, that's something we can follow up. And then the beauty of these tools is that any idea you have or any mechanism uh, can be tested. And, and another uh, me a meta point I wanna make is, and this is uh, Thomas's uh, constraints, by putting in constraints, more constraints on the, uh, uh, the connectivity within a layer of the cortex, you can pull out even more uh, and better performance. I mean, that that's that's taking it one step further. Uh, you probably know that convolutional lower networks were, were uh, inspired by what Hubel and Weasel uh, from that 60s era, 1960s, what, what they knew about the hierarchy and what they knew about the simple and complex cells. And so there's there's so much we know, more we know now about the, the circuit properties and the interactions and the physiology in the cortex that uh, I, I, this is really gonna be going back and forth between the, uh, the, the, the people who are studying brain circuits and people who are studying um, artificial uh, circuits. We have a question here about why variability is so high. Is it intrinsic noise or perhaps balanced network? Uh, the, yeah, the, the, I, you know, the, this is something that we haven't really explored yet, but uh, it, it, in my mind, what's happening is you're, you're looking at statistics of, of the arrival of, um, you know, clumps of inhibition that uh, are gonna turn off uh, the, the unit for a long time because you know some of the time constants are pretty long that were learned. Uh, so I think it's statistics, just statistics of the number of uh, inhibitory uh, inputs and uh, the, 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 whatever these uh, intervals, spiking intervals are. Do your results uh, give any uh, insight into potential applications to recurrent neural networks to reproduce brain motor cortex activity or other motor activities? Ah, uh, so I think that, yeah, I, 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 the, the, what, so what's missing here? Uh, this is just a simple transformation uh, from one temporal pattern to another. Uh, and that could be used as a building block for many, many other functions, inc including generating uh, complex motor signals. Uh, we haven't done that yet, but you know, the, the, I, I really think this is uh, just you know, the first, we're taking our first steps here. And it's, uh, it actually reminds me of what was like, remember Bill back in the eighties when we had uh, the first backprop results? Uh, we, we use simple feed forward networks with one layer of hidden units to uh, 
to, to try to understand population codes. And uh, we used it uh, in visual cortex to understand simple cells. This is uh, Sidney Leckie, had a paper in Nature. And uh, Anderson and Zipser had a really nice model showing transformation between retinal coordinates and head-based coordinates produced uh, gain fields in the hidden layer. So in a sense, this is what we're happening today is basically a, a, an extension of the, the simple networks that we had uh, already were giving us some insight, but it, they're so much better now and computers are so much more powerful that we can, we have you know, almost unlimited, you know, we're only, only limited by our own imagination now because uh, we, we can really rely on these learning techniques to, to, to probe and to uh, uncover and come up with, with new uh, motifs, new network uh, properties that uh, maybe, we, you know, we, we were just maybe a lot more there. By the way, I, I really am completely convinced now that uh, the inhibitory interneurons are really the, the major players in uh, directing information within the cortex and organizing a lot of functions. Uh, and, and so the, I think we should have known that just from the fact there's so many different types of interneurons compared to the, the pyramidal cells, which seems to be innocent bystanders. Uh, one more question was how your time constants were learned. Was that a back propagation procedure to learn those? Yes, it turns out that any differentiable function uh, can, be, can be learned. That parameter can be learned with back prop. And anything that uh, you, you, know, you, want to, you want to throw in there. So, you know, but this is, again, we just put in the ones that we thought were important and they apparently were. Great. Well, we can revisit some of these things in the discussion period later. Thank you. And uh, Sam, you want to introduce the next speaker? Sure. So the next speaker is uh, Kenji Doya uh, from Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. And I'll invite him to the screen right now. Just a OK. Hi, good morning. Uh, can you uh, see me and uh, hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, I'm very pleased uh, to have this opportunity to join this workshop, uh, uh, even though it is uh, uh, 4.52 in the morning in Japan. Uh, and especially as after Terry, who was uh, my postdoc as by the, in the uh, 1990s. Okay, so how can I share my screen? Uh, okay, so uh, this uh, share screen button. Uh, yeah, so if you hover over your name, you should see the, the different uh, icons pop up, one, one of which is share screen. Yeah, looks like it's working. Do you, and uh, do you see my uh, PowerPoint uh, now? Uh, we saw it a second, yeah, now we see it. Okay, yeah. All right, so uh, uh, I'm from uh, Okinawa uh, Institute of uh, Science and uh, Technology uh, from uh, Southern Island of Japan. So uh, the title uh, today's talk is Toward Multi-Scale Brain Data Assimilation. Okay, so uh, yeah, so this is uh, my version of uh, how the brain theory meets uh, big data. So uh, we have some uh, models uh, about uh, the conceptual models of how the brain should be working. And these days, uh, uh, you have a lot of data about uh, what the brain uh, is, uh, real, really is. Right? So uh, the, we should eventually uh, connect these. And then to do that, uh, computational models are very important. Some of them are very uh, abstract, a uh, functional level model and some of them are very detailed uh, biophysical models. And then the, you have a uh, top-down inference about how the model should work and uh, bottom-up uh, data uh, to uh, constrain uh, our models. And then the, 
uh, in doing uh, both direction of uh, uh, search, uh, machine learning is very uh, important because the machine learning theories and uh, pictures uh, will allow us to come up with the candidates of the abstract functional models. And also the machine learning methods allow us to constrain our model based on the uh, rich experimental data. So today I'd like to introduce some of the uh, works that uh, my lab and uh, my collaborators have been doing. Uh, for example, uh, several years ago, so uh, we did a, a project of uh, application machine learning to psychiatry under the program called the Strategic Research Program for Brain Sciences in Japan. So uh, uh, my collaborators uh, at the psych psychiatry psychiatry department obtained lots of data uh, from uh, functional MRI and uh, blood markers, uh, including uh, uh, genotypes and also uh, many clinical uh, data. And then uh, we want to combine these uh, variety of data using machine learning. So uh, you can use a, a kind of unsupervised learning paradigm to identify possible subtypes of the disease and also use a supervised learning paradigm to uh, the diagnosis uh, and also the prediction of the uh, medication responses. So that was our idea. So uh, there has been uh, many studies going on uh, in this program. So uh, one recent uh, report from our lab uh, is to apply uh, unsupervised learning paradigm uh, called match view co clustering to uh, uh, different data including uh, functional MRI uh, uh, and the genetic and the clinical data uh, and then uh, we found that some of the uh, uh, subject cluster separated the, uh, the depression patients and the controls uh, and uh, uh, within the uh, depression subjects, uh, some of them uh, had a, a, a drug resistance even after like uh, several weeks uh, or months of uh, uh, SSRI treatment, uh, symptoms were not uh, uh, very good. So, uh, and then using this uh, paradigm, we could uh, uh, separate uh, the subjects uh, uh, first based on the functional connectivity uh, of the resting MRI data uh, around the uh, angular uh, cortex, and also the, the past history of uh, like a childhood uh, stress. So uh, uh, some of them uh, can be uh, uh, predicted as a drug uh, resistance. So uh, uh, this was a very early study where with a relatively small number of subjects, but now we, uh, our colleagues are increasing the number of patients to uh, come up with a more reliable ways of uh, subtyping of the subject and also uh, uh, diagnosis of the uh, subjects. Okay. So another uh, kind of a, uh, more recent work we have been working on uh, is uh, in Japan's uh, brains, uh, Brain Minds program. This is a flagship neuroscience program using uh, marmoset uh, monkeys. So this is the uh, major uh, main website. And we also have a dedicated uh, data portal, uh, like a Brain Minds uh, and JP. So here we have uh, different kinds of data, like a basic brain atlas and uh, uh, also, we have some uh, human data to eventually uh, co 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 uh, translate what we found uh, in the Bamoset brain to the human uh, uh, medical applications. And uh, we have a high field, like 9.4 Tesla uh, MRI for Bamoset monkeys. Uh, and uh, uh, we performed uh, uh, the Electrocorticography, so the uh, brain wave was uh, measured from the cortical surface uh, and also tracer injections and so on. And uh, we also have uh, the gene expression data as well. Okay. And that uh, 
So uh, this project is going to get uh, many different uh, uh, data about the structure of the brain uh, uh, and also the function or activities of the brain. But if those data are just stored separately, that is not very interesting. We have to combine uh, these uh, structural and uh, functional data right? uh, as uh, computational models. So, and the models can be uh, at the different levels. Some of the uh, like a macroscopic model, uh, modeling the, uh, each population uh, uh, by the average fine rate, or a spiking network model, uh, modeling the uh, spike of uh, individual neurons, or even subcellular structural uh, models like conduction based or signaling cascade. And uh, uh, ideally, these uh, models with different levels uh, should be uh, uh, constrained with each other. Right? And today, uh, we are going to talk about uh, some of our work uh, trying to uh, combine the uh, diffusion MRI data with the neural tracer data. Uh, and also diffusion MRI data with the functional uh, MRI data and the electrophotogram data. Okay, so uh, uh, one uh, project we performed uh, is uh, uh, optimization of a uh, fiber tracking from diffusion uh, MRI data. Right? So diffusion MRI uh, is a way of uh, uh, analyzing the brain in terms of the water uh, diffusion uh, direction. So if there's a, a, a myelinated uh, nerve fibers, diffusion of water uh, is a constraint to the direction of the uh, fibers. So with that, from that information, we can uh, estimate the local direction of the fiber running. And by concatenating those uh, fiber direction, we can uh, draw a kind of a global uh, connection uh, of the brain areas. But of course, the reliability uh, of such a global connection uh, depends on the tracking algorithm, and they have some uh, several parameters. Right? So uh, uh, some of the parameters uh, have a good basis from biophysics, but some of the parameters we have to optimize. And uh, fortunately, uh, in the brain man's project, we have the both uh, diffusion MRI data and also neural tracer injection data, which can be worked as a reference for optimizing the fiber tracking algorithms. So uh, we implemented a kind of multi-objective uh, optimization framework to uh, optimize uh, these parameters of fiber tracking algorithms. And then uh, by optimizing them, so uh, the, we could see an improvement uh, in the tracking, especially for the long range fibers. And then the resulting connection matrix uh, became different uh, compared to the default parameter people usually use. And this is the actual implementation of our uh, algorithm. So uh, uh, the Carlos, uh, who did uh, this work, uh, came up with a uh, first tested a single uh, objective, like a true uh, positive rate. Uh, but uh, he uh, proposed uh, like a combination of four uh, objectives, like a distance weighted a true positive rate and the ratio between true positive and false positive rate. Uh, and also the region-wise uh, connection uh, uh, coincidence, uh, and also the passage of a long range fiber right into the commercial area. And then by applying the, this uh, uh, multiple uh, optimization algorithm, we could see uh, these uh, uh, objectives uh, improve over uh, kind of a, uh, generations uh, and also the uh, average fiber lengths became longer by the optimization. And uh, we uh, optimized the parameters using uh, 10 uh, injection uh, sites data and then they tested uh, for six injection sites which were not uh, used for uh, optimization. And then uh, we could uh, verify the good uh, generalization of the performance even for the uh, data set, uh, uh, for the, the brain regions, which were not used uh, for optimization. So uh, this can be used uh, for the uh, validation uh, of the uh, fiber tracking uh, algorithms. And uh, uh, after uh, making sure uh, our uh, fiber tracking algorithm is doing the right job, we try to uh, use it uh, uh, to combine 
the functional MRI data and the uh, diffusion MRI data. And from diffusion MRI data with the fiber uh, tracking, we can come up with a, a connectivity matrix across a, a different uh, parts of the brain. So uh, in this example, we uh, parcelated the mammoth of the brain into 60 regions of interest, and then have a 60 by 60 uh, connection matrix. And then the uh, plug such a connection matrix into a, a dynamic model. So in this case, uh, we use a relatively simple uh, rate model of a Wilson Cohen type, so which uh, assumes the uh, excitatory population and the inferior population are connected with each other. And this excited population have a long range uh, connection uh, based on the uh, connective matrix uh, coming from the diffusion MRI. And we have some parameters like a gain of this uh, low range connection and the strengths uh, of uh, uh, interaction between the excitatory, inhibitory, and inhibitory to excitatory connections. And then by uh, tuning these parameters, uh, uh, we can uh, compute, uh, simulate the neural activity and compute the functional connectivity matrix. And from a, a functional MRI, we can also uh, observe the border signal and then the obtained empirical functional connectivity. And then we see whether uh, these are two uh, like features of the dynamics uh, can uh, uh, match each other. And uh, this is a framework proposed by uh, Gustavo Deco. Uh, first in the human uh, MR data, we are testing it with, with a uh, mouseset uh, MR data with a validated uh, uh, connection matrix. So uh, yeah, so this is the uh, uh, sorry, sorry. There's some uh, error in that the font, uh, but uh, uh, we. Uh, tested how the model behaved uh, by the different strengths of a uh, uh, excitatory uh, uh, connection uh, and the inhibitory co uh, connection. Just as uh, uh, Terry uh, told in previous talk, the uh, balance between excitatory and inhibitory uh, connection is very important. The model performance uh, changes a lot by the balance of this excitatory and inhibitory uh, connection. So uh, by uh, setting some of the parameters, the uh, uh, functional connectivity uh, produced by the model have a, a high correlation with the functional connectivity produced uh, from the uh, functional MRI measurements. So the, uh, that is the, uh, the, what we could uh, uh, show from uh, this uh, optimization. And we can also uh, visualize uh, the dynamic activities uh, from the simulated model and uh, observed uh, both signal. Okay. okay. And uh, we are further uh, uh, considering the way to uh, combine the structural uh, and uh, functional data in the framework of uh, data assimilation. So uh, data simulation uh, is a kind of dynamic Bayesian framework which combine the dynamic uh, model and uh, uh, multimodal, uh, in general, noisy observation. And then the, this uh, uh, model uh, gives a kind of uh, uh, predictive prior and that is uh, uh, matched with the uh, likelihood coming from the observed data to give a posterior distribution of the uh, state of the uh, simulation model given the available data. And that is used for the uh, prediction uh, of the uh, model uh, and also estimation of the unknown parameters. And uh, this performance can be uh, used for the improvement of the uh, measurement methods. And uh, this framework has been quite successfully used in uh, uh, the forecast. Uh, people built a, a very uh, large-scale uh, dynamic model with atmosphere uh, using uh, some kind of a, a partial differential equation uh, and combine them uh, with uh, meteorological uh, observation either from the satellite or uh, the different equipment on land 
and then uh, make a best estimate of the current state of the atmosphere and use them for the uh, prediction of the weather uh, so several hours later or several days, days later. And uh, my colleague uh, Ken Nakai proposed to use the same framework for the brain. So uh, we have a structural uh, model uh, coming from a uh, diffusion MRI and the tractography, which gives us a connection matrix. And we have uh, observation of the activity uh, from the functional MRI or electrocorticogram, electrodes uh, placed uh, on the surface of the brain. And then we can combine the uh, the model based on such connectivity data with the measurement uh, by the MRI or EcoG in the framework of a uh, data simulation. So uh, when this model uh, is a uh, linear, we can use a simple, uh, like classic Kalman filtering. So when this model is nonlinear, uh, we can use, for example, uh, uh, the particle filtering. So the method commonly used for uh, like a weather forecast is called uh, ensemble carbon filtering, which is uh, similar to uh, particle filtering uh, in terms of representing re distribution by the collection of points. But update uh, of the points are based on a carbon filtering uh, framework. So it has been shown to be scalable to high dimension dynamic model. So we have been uh, testing uh, this framework uh, to this uh, electrocorticogram uh, with uh, four, 64 electrodes placed uh, on the uh, cortical surface of the mammal's brain. And then the, we can use a, a, a dynamic model uh, based on the diffusion MRI. So either the uh, high dimension model like uh, uh, 1500 nodes in the cortical surface or more uh, conventional regions of interest around 60. And the question is uh, whether we can predict uh, the uh, high dimension brain activity based on the limited uh, measurement uh, of the uh, electrodes. So uh, uh, Ken tested this framework uh, by assuming a linear model of this high dimension uh, cortical surface model. And he could show by uh, uh, the observation from the 64 points uh, uh, in the cortical brain. So we could, he could simulate uh, the uh, estimate the underlying activity in the cortical surface. So now uh, we are trying to uh, validate uh, this uh, result uh, with uh, functional MRI data. And also uh, uh, another colleague, Hiromichi, is uh, working on uh, uh, kind of nonlinear uh, data assimilation uh, using Wilson Kuwa model and the uh, ensemble common filtering. So this is still a very early phase, uh, but uh, uh, for the 60 uh, ROI uh, model, uh, we observe activity to only the excitatory neurons and use the data assimilation to uh, estimate the activity of the uh, inhibitory neurons, which uh, seems to be running fairly well. And even after uh, we stop observation, uh, we can continue prediction uh, of the network dynamics for some time. And we can use uh, this framework also for uh, estimation of the parameters, uh, like excitatory infinity connection or infinity to excitatory connection. So this is a kind of a very early, but uh, uh, encouraging result. Okay, so uh, uh, let me conclude. So, uh, 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 I show some examples of uh, uh, data-driven uh, approach, uh, like a uh, uh, human uh, MRI data for psychiatry, uh, and also the optimization and validation of the uh, tracer uh, fiber tracking algorithm using tracer and the MRI data, and also uh, combining the structural and the functional data for uh, understanding the underlying brain dynamics. So uh, I think uh, data simulation, which has been shown to scale well uh, in other uh, fields like uh, uh, meteorology, uh, might be a very good framework uh, for uh, combining high dimension uh, uh, experimental data from the brain. So uh, currently we are working on the only single level 
and extending it to a much scale uh, is a very uh, interesting uh, future work. Okay, so thank you very much for your uh, attention. And then this is uh, based on uh, the collaboration and the strategy research program for brain sciences and the brain minds program. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kenji. So uh, maybe we'll just segue directly into discussion and ask some questions for Kenji. Sam, meanwhile, you're going to invite the participants up. And if anyone else wants to be invited up, uh, please just say something on the uh, chat and then we can do that. Uh, so what are the next steps, Kenji, with what you're doing here? How are you going to now apply this in a clinical domain? <clears throat> oh, yeah. So uh, uh, we previously applied the, uh, the MRI data for the, uh, either subtyping or diagnosis. But that is uh, uh, only uh, the, just the mapping from the data to uh, a class label. But we really want to understand the uh, difference in the brain dy dynamics. So rather than just uh, uh, using a uh, uh, classification, we want to characterize uh, the difference of the brain dynamics between the, uh, the control subjects and the uh, patients of uh, different uh, uh, disorders not only uh, the depression, uh, but also schizophrenia or ASD and so on. So, and then the, uh, having a deeper understanding the brain functioning in health and disease uh, in a data-driven way uh, is uh, the direction we want to uh, 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 follow. Has your data so far shed any light on the different uh, subtypes of schizophrenia? Uh, Not the subtypes of schizophrenia, but uh, my colleagues uh, in the, this uh, uh, program uh, have uh, uh, identified the relationship between the brain dynamics uh, of the uh, SD patients uh, and the schizophrenic uh, uh, patients. So uh, uh, they have some commonality and the distinct uh, part. Right? So, uh, uh, but uh, uh, interpretation uh, of the difference in the functional connectivity is still uh, uh, rather difficult. So uh, uh, one limitation is that we just use uh, uh, like a resting state uh, MRI. So inclusion of uh, the data during certain task MRI might uh, give us a better uh, uh, insight about uh, the brain function not just the investing, but also uh, doing some kind of uh, uh, goal-directed uh, behaviors. So uh, yeah, there's a still uh, lot of things to do, uh, but uh, there are some uh, kind of uh, encouraging uh, results coming up. Yeah. That's very interesting. So let's open up the discussion. Um, I see we do have Terry here, and he had a couple of questions from earlier that didn't get asked. Uh, someone was asking about the biological experiments that you would propose to test what you've been uh, measuring in your models. What would you do? Yeah, very, very uh, important issue. Um, so one of the predictions is that the connectivity between the inhibitory units should have these uh, subclusters or you know subunits that uh, have strong uh, inhibitory connections between them and uh, Within the next, uh, sometime this, this later this year, uh, we're going to have the connectome of a cubic millimeter of cortex. This is coming out of Clay Reed's lab, and so they'll they'll have the connectivity pattern. And and you know we've made the prediction for uh, the inhibitory for the somatostatin uh, inhibitory neurons in the prefrontal cortex. But but um, but th th there are a lot of other predictions that uh, can can be extracted. Uh, it, depending on what the question is, like for example, we first noticed this uh, Fano factor in the network, uh, and and fortunately, you know, the data were already there, so we can test the prediction directly from the data. So uh, uh, that those are the kinds of predictions that uh, I, I had in mind. Uh, 
but uh, you know, the, these are very small networks, and uh, the, 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 in terms of the tasks that we're putting in, are their toy tasks, and so there's still a lot more uh, needs to be done. Uh, you know, in terms of looking, scaling up, uh, and putting in, uh, for example, more choices, not just uh, two choices. And there was another question for you with regard to. Um whether you can use multiple time scales during the delay period or just uh, have a single time scale. Yeah, the, 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 uh, it's up to you. Uh, you. You can pick whatever task or try. If you want to have a task that has two time scales, uh, you know, that could be uh, learned as well. Uh, the, these, you know, the, 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 this backpropagation algorithm uh, gives you a lot of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, time scales, uh, multiple time scales. So uh, yeah, that that would be another uh, step forward is to is to include the time complexity as well as the spatial complexity. So with regard to having further discussion here, it seems like we're somewhat limited if we're only allowed to have four people on at once, and we have mm -hmm. like ten people just on our panel, and then we have a hundred and mm -hmm. some people who would like to speak, no doubt. Um, has anybody used this app before? And <laughs> have any idea how mm -hmm. that can be done or if it can be done? <clears throat> You could put the voices of everybody up, you, you know, with the faces. Yes, right. of the matter. Thinking we could just do audio streams. Uh, at the moment, Sam, you can kick off at least Kenji and me, and uh, you guys mm -hmm. uh, can invite somebody else up to talk. And we got various people here I know like to talk. Jim Bowers here. Jim, you like to talk. You want to say something on our topic? Okay, uh, so I don't I, uh, go out. Okay, okay so, okay. All right, kick me off. And even kick Terry off. Got anybody who wants to come in? Kick them off. So who's next for questions? Anyone? Jim Bauer says never. Okay, can, can I ask a question? Yeah. So, um, so you know, Bill, you know, you, you're – You've been working on these very detailed compartmental models, and I was a little surprised that we didn't have a lot of a lot more of that uh, in terms of representing the the, the advances and the how the, the, you've used those uh, over the years. And so, I wonder if you can expand on that. What what, what your view is of where compartmental models are today? Well, with respect to uh, yeah, what what we've been talking about here. Uh, I keep hoping for someone to tell me what I believe just instinctively to be true, <laughs> that there are features that are critical about spiking. And uh, I think you can speak to that from your simulations, that there are features that are critical about high amplitude oscillations with enormous coordination across cells, and that there are critical features about uh, dendrites, which I think you partly touched upon when you talked about the difference between parvalbumin, which would be soma projecting, and somatostatin, which would be dendritic projecting interneurons. So, uh, yeah, I've, you know, continued over the years, decades, to come up with more questions than I have answers, so I'm happy to direct to you for answers, as, as I always have, Terry. Well, I, I, I think that what's, uh, what's really missing from these deep learning models is uh, the, the uh, spatial interactions on dendrites. In other words, uh, we, we know that branches can have a certain autonomy. We know that synapses are clustered and it can interact with each other. Um, and so th those, those are all computational mechanisms that are just crying for uh, a computational Role and I, I think we can incorporate them in. I think all of these that we you know there's no reason why compartmental models are all differentiable. We should be able to uh, backpropagate right through them. So we, we had hoped to have Iran Segev here to talk about his paper where he looked at yes. a single cell and right. tried to develop it as a neural network. And Bartlett Mel has done some of that same kind of work. Right, um, but so, yeah. they did it in the old-fashioned way, which is you know come up with some idea for a function and then fiddle with the parameters until you get it to work. The, the, the beauty of, of our modern era is that, uh, for example, you know, for our delayed, you know, uh, you know, 
uh, delay period, uh, when we got it to work, we expected to, that it would discover our smart, uh, you know, uh, attractor model, because that everybody knows that that's uh, very robust and it, it, it was uh, a lot of you know dozens of papers, including some of ours. And no, it found a completely different way of, of solving the problem. And uh, and I think as we put more constraints in with more mechanisms, that we'll discover other ways to solve problems that nobody had ever really thought of before. So that's where I think. Uh, we're, I, I, I'm really hoping for uh, more progress uh, by combining th these tools and techniques with what we already know. Yeah, and in those terms, one thing that occurred to me as someone was asking about time constants, so they were asking a different context, is how you have these enormous numbers of different voltage sensitive potassium channels, uh, less enormous, but also a fair number of different voltage sensitive calcium channels, voltage sensitive. Uh, sodium channels and the time constants just spread out all over the place and presumably there's some kind of a spectral advantage to having all of that, that that's still underappreciated. So, uh, it, it, you know, there's a really, uh, I heard uh, Rudolf Sepulcher uh, give a talk on this, it was uh, at Telluride, and uh, and he's, he has, he's a control theorist and so he looks at neurons very differently from the way we do. We see, we see them as a bag of ion channels, but he sees them in terms of uh, feedback systems. And one of the what really important points that he makes is that even within, say, a neurons that you have to, when you have a certain time scale, you, you have to have a uh, negative feedback in order to be able to control the positive currents. And in the obvious one, there's a Hodgkin Huxley axon, you know, the sodium and delayed rectifier. But, um, but the, the same thing holds for uh, the late after polarization and a lot of other pairs of currents. And so I, th I think that some insight will come from understanding uh, how all, each of those currents uh, interacts and is there to uh, uh, be able to control homeostatically other currents. But, but he has a paper, and I, I highly recommend it. Just look up Sepulcher, Rudolf Sepulcher. Very, -E very. P U L C H R E. I don't even know. I don't know. Yeah, it's Sepulcher, as in the tomb. The tomb. Okay, yeah. it'll be very easy. Very unfortunate. Find. Very unfortunate. But that's. Poor guy. That's it. All right, we have Jim Bauer here, and I just want to make a historical note that there was a day 30 years ago when Jim and Terry would go head to head, and that was a lot of fun. So maybe we can get some excitement here. Well, you should point out that it was Jim who actually founded this meeting. That's right. And and Jim has a his, historical book on this. So we, everyone should read that about the 20 years of CNS. Yes. Good to see you, Terry. Good to see you, Jim. Somehow we got old. Funny thing. Yes, that happens. Uh, you know, if, if you wait long enough, it, it happens. Yeah, but then what happens is you start pushing more and more data into a network that's more and more uh, constricted in terms of its resources, and you end up coming up with solutions to the problem that have to do with understanding the nature of the problem rather than just lookup tables, right? You know, it's all in uh, their tools, and you can use the tools well or poorly. <clears throat> exactly. So we had a whole, whole conversation uh, uh, earlier today about why compartmental modeling seems to sort of be out of favor or there are fewer examples of it at CNS this year than usual. And so I'm curious, Terry, why you think that might be true? Uh, well, I think fields go through ups and downs and uh, well, just look at NIPS, okay? so. I'm, I'm the president of the foundation that's run that meeting for over 30 years. And, um, you know, it was uh, inspired by the, the first wave of neural networks and a hot field net was very inspirational back then. And, and you know, the, 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 it, 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 we didn't actually, looking back, we didn't know what was going on, but what really was happening was inspired by the brain, we uh, went off uh, into exploring the computational space, high dimensional space 
where you have a lot of interacting units, right? And uh, big data, you know, in other words, in order to get the, the learning to converge, you needed a lot of data. And, and, and you know, we, we went as far as we could uh, with the computing power we had back then. And so it, it kind of peaked. And then, but what happened was that uh, a lot of other tools and techniques showed up, which were very powerful in machine learning to handle big data. And so, you know, there was a period of about 10, 15, 20 years where, you know, it, 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 it went into a, a, a exploding into many different directions, you know, graphical models, support vector machines, which are all, by the way, are used now in neuroscience, you know, like for fMRI data. You, you heard uh, from uh, Kenji's talk, you know, that this, this is, uh, the, you know, people who do fMRI, are all, they've used these tools now for decades. And so it, it it's, it's uh, and now, but going back to the, the issue is that, over the last decade now, we, the, 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 the things have scaled up and computing power and data are all there. So now the, the ideas we had can now be uh, in, enhanced. And for me, the, what's exciting is that uh, as, as neuroscience goes into big data and you can record now from tens of thousands of cells, 100,000 cells simultaneously, um, who, wh you know, what are you gonna do? You, you can't just you know, do tuning curves uh, the way we did it one cell at a time. And so look, looking, we have to have ways of uh, analyzing populations of cells. And it turns out that the tools that were developed by people in machine learning turn out to be good ones for being able to visualize and extract out uh, population activity. So, you know, it, it, so I think the same thing with the compartmental models. I think that, uh, you know, there was an early period where we were just trying to understand dendrites in, in some fundamental way. And we, and, you know, over the decades, we've actually done, made a lot of progress and we understand a lot about dendrites, Not, you know, it's still a lot to do, but, but I think uh, the, the second era, which is now just beginning, which is to try to use computational tools to go in and query uh, what's happening, you know, what, what, what is a dendrite computing? What, 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 what's the complexity of the information that can be, decoded by dendrites. And so, so I think compartmental models have, a, a, you know, they're, they're going to come back. I think that is just a matter of, of again, these, uh, maybe the generational, maybe it has to do with, uh, you know, a, a new group of people coming in with the same excitement we had back in the 80s. Uh, so at the NeurIPS meeting this last December, we had uh, 14,000 people show up. Uh, I don't know, how, how, does anybody know how many people have shown up here uh, uh, at this uh, CNS meeting? I think about 2,000 registered for the meeting. <clears throat> um, okay. So, which is, a, <clears throat> which is a good thing. Yeah, as you know, I was one of the first organizers of the NIPS meeting way, way back when. Yes, I, I, I um, went through some of those old papers recently. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, Yasser Abba Mustafa and I organized it for the first couple of years, way back when. Um, right. Right. Anyway, so yes, was interesting time. My my question about that is this: um, so we all agree, sort of fundamentally, I assume that neurons represent sort of the computational base for how brains work. Do we accept that? Sort of some version of the neuron doctrine. Doctrine. Well, I, you know, I, I, I believe in multiple levels. I, I think that you, you, single neurons definitely capture some fundamental unit. Uh, but I think that... By the way, I'm not, I'm not saying that single neurons, that by li listening to a single... I mean, I was also one of the people that invented multi-unit recording back in the early 80s, right? So... I deeply believe in that for a long time that you can't understand a neuron outside of the context in which it's in, and that context context is both the network plus the other neurons are involved. So, you know, deeply believe that. <clears throat> but the the question is this: um, sort of, if you're going to discover function, which is quite a different thing than, say, making a model that explains to people what you think the function is. If you're going to discover function, you know, in the nervous system, what level of modeling 
do you should you do to do that so and 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 just as an aside and some of you heard me talk about this before you know there are many models at many different levels that can replicate data <clears throat> um, probably the most successful model in the history of the world for replicating data was the model of Ptolemy which explained for 200 years after the introduction of Copernicus more accurately than the Copernican model where you could find planets in the night sky. So replicating data is a good thing for models to do, but it isn't really proof of anything. And maybe one can argue that the further you get away from the physics or the further, further you get away from the, the sort of computational or structural base, the more likely you are to generate models that replicate data, but don't tell you anything. So there's pretty good evidence that the inverse square law came out of the fact that Newton actually made a model of the moon going around the earth and then invented or stole the calculus to actually and found out that it that the, that the force he measured was roughly, and it wasn't exactly right, but roughly inverse square to the distance. So that was a case where he built a model that was based on the, close to the physics and out of it discovered something. So my, this was a conversation we had earlier, so I'm sort of summarizing it. My concern about the move off in the direction of more abstract models, and this has been my concern forever, and Terry and I have talked about this forever too. <laughs> okay. But my concern about moving off into the area in the direction of sort of more abstract models, you know, bringing in machine learning, you can replicate data. The question is what you discover. And my guess from experience is that if you want to discover, okay, if you want to discover how the brain computes you somehow have to be really connected to the elements that do that. Okay, that's not to say that the networks don't contribute that I mean, all of that, but the element that ultimately sort of is making decisions based on what's coming into it, as far as what goes out of it, in a simple form, is a neuron. And if you are hope and I'm making a statement of belief. Um, if you're hoping to actually let the nervous system itself tell you what's happening, which is not a lot of what computational neuroscience kind of does these days, I don't think, but anyway, then you need modeling at the level that has the, the physics, enough physics in it to be able for that model to say, aha, look at this. Okay, it turns out the parallel fibers don't do what people think they've been doing for 100 years. Right. No, it is, that's what you need. I, no, I completely agree with you. There's no doubt that uh, there's a lot we, we don't yet know. And that uh, and, and let me give you one concrete example of something that I think was an important advance that hasn't really been absorbed yet by the community. So about a year ago, uh, there was a paper that came out in science was from uh, Karen Dini's lab and uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, Harris, Harris and Car Karen Dini. Uh, and what they had recorded from was uh, from, I think it was like 40,000 neurons simultaneously using neuropixels in the visual cortex. And um, the first experiment was simply to look at, you know, resting activity, which, you know, in fMRI has become a big business too. And, uh, and so they, they recorded all the spontaneous activity going on in a mouse that was head fixed. Uh, and they, they, they also did the same experiment with uh, optical recording, got the same results. But the, 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 what was astonishing is that uh, at the same time that they were doing the recording, uh, they were videotaping the snout of the mouse, the face, and, uh, and, and it turns out that the, the mouse is always moving its, its snout, it's breathing, the whiskers are going back and forth. And so there's a lot of uh, motion. And, and so they analyzed, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the, 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 using optical flow, you know, which, which parts of the face were moving in what direction. 
And then they did a regression. I think it was a simple linear regression. They asked, you know, the spontaneous activity in the cortex, could we predict the optical flow of the face? And the answer was yes, you could explain half the variance. You know, uh, that's a motor signal. And, uh, and vice versa, if you, if you take the optical flow, you can predict the spontaneous activity. Okay, what, is that, what that's telling us, the spontaneous activity is not just noise. Right, well, Terry, you should be muted, or maybe I just can't hear you. No, he's, he was um, muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, yeah, but you know, and this is a conversation we've had before, online and otherwise, I think the word noise is vastly uh, overused and wrongly used in neuroscience. Right. Noise is how you explain things that you don't understand. Completely. Yeah, but yeah. the but the the core one of the core insights of shannon was that if you want an optimal communication channel okay information theory between two points you want if you're if you're building the coding for that channel you want the coding the end result of the coding to look as much like the full spectrum noise on that channel as you can that is optimal communication if you're using a channel if you put full spectrum noise in one end you look at what comes out the other end and then you use that as the way to design your coding so if you look as you know uh, ed posner sorry we're old guys ed posner who is one of the core guys involved also in starting the nips meeting as well as actually the meeting in Santa Barbara, which I think is the first time you and I ever met, was the meeting in Santa Barbara, right? Anyway, Ed Posner designed the communication system for the Voyager, okay? And if you look at the signals coming down from the Voyager, if you do not know the coding, it looks like noise because it's efficiently coded. So in the nervous system, we record from neurons which have this, many have this beautiful distribution that looks at all, all the world like a Poisson, you know, distribution. And then we declare, aha, there's a lot of noise. You gotta deal with noise and blah, blah, blah. The, the ultimately, and I've said this for years, we will get closer to understanding neural coding when we peel away the noise excuse and start actually understanding that that the uh, tremendous amounts of apparent noise probably just rep represents the the uh, sophistication of the coding in the brain and let me just toss out one other thing while we're at it as you know you know i've studied the olfactory system for a long time and as you probably know and you knew this was going to come up i'm sorry <laughs> i see you smiling anyway i actually personally believe you should never go to visual cortex unless you spend a lot of time working in olfaction. And that's a whole other conversation, Jim. So it is, but let me just say, maybe let the old guys the, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. a chance to say something. Gunnar here, look how young uh, he is. He is bald, but he's young. But he's unwrinkled. He's unwrinkled. Yeah. You're bald. Hey, Gunnar, young, what did well. you want to ask? Yeah, well, I have a couple of things. So, um, uh, th first of all, this is uh, basically the first time I'm interacting with this community. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I come more from a general modeling of biological systems where we have constructed rather comprehensive models for different organs from sort of intracellular level to, to whole body level, how they are communicating. And as I presented before, we have done some models for some aspects of the brain. Um, but uh, I, I think I could come with some inputs on how we have managed to do the maybe comparatively complex task of modeling the, the, the body as a whole, but not specifically the brain in all its aspects. And um, uh, one of the key things that we have really used in subdividing the modeling problem uh, is to identify subsystems uh, where you can measure the inputs and the outputs. Uh, so for instance, uh, for organs, you can measure the, uh, the blood flow that goes into the, into the organ and the blood flow that leaves the organ. 
uh, and then by knowing sort of what the organ is exposed to and then seeing what it's doing to the blood. So you can, you can measure the concentrations and so on. Then, then you can consider the modeling of that organ as an isolated problem, which means that you can sort of go ahead and model that for as many years as you want and come up with first simple models and then increasingly more complex models all the while knowing that all of these different submodels will fit together with the models of the other organs because the input output profile is correct and in that way we have sort of been able to subdivide the enormous task of modeling the body as a whole in different groups that are focusing on different organs uh, and we can put the models together in the end because we sort of have the proper subdivision of tasks in a way and uh, one of the things but I would like to know is, have you thought about similar ways of subdividing the task of modeling the brain? In That's terms how of we do it. That's metabolic how we do. requirements. Is that what you're pointing no, out? No, in, well, in no he's way. asking in terms of function. And the problem is that the kidney, you know what it does. Okay. And, and you can define what the kidney or what the heart does using well-described sort of either from chemistry or from engineering ways to, to characterize that. We don't know what the brain does at that level. Not close. But, well, I mean, there and are different if you look within the, I know, but if you look within the brain, for example, we like to assign tasks, like the cerebellum is a motor control structure, which it probably mm -hmm. isn't, but we have assigned it that task for 150 years. Okay, but exactly what does that mean at the level of the modeling you're doing? What is the input and what is the output? to be able to do the kind of modeling that you're talking about, we do not know. And it's a very hard problem. And I would, by the way, I'd just add one other quick thing. If you're building models of the brain of the body and you're not including what the nervous system does in its control, eventually you're gonna have to work with us. Yeah, of course, of course. And, and, uh, and that's, I mean, one major reason why we have the brain and, and what we have been doing primarily is just in neurovascular coupling. Uh, which is uh, sort of takes electrical activity as input and then calculates how that is propagating through the different uh, signals or, or cells that are involved in secreting vasoactive substances to control the blood flow. Uh, uh, but what we haven't done yet, and this is basically what I'm hoping to get out of this meeting, is to find connections with people who have sort of the beginning of that process, the electrophysiology and, and, uh, and because we have lots of predictions of what the different cell types must do in terms of electrophysiology to create the, the, the correct time profiles of the vasoactive substances. And, uh, and uh, I mean, for, for me, it would be very interesting to hold that up to corresponding models where you model the electrophysiology much more in detail. And I think that there are similar physiological functions of the brain, which, which are very much similar to modeling other organs, while there also are these more sort of esoterical, magical things like learning and so on that we sort of don't really know if we even have the right concepts or... Uh, um, Jim, my apologies. I'm going to kick you off to let someone else on. Sorry. I'm used to it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> So, so Gunnar, I, I have something to add, which is that, uh, you know, for many years, I would say that uh, we're studying the brain, which is the most complex device in the known universe. So my, my wife, who is a uh, MD, PhD, took me aside and said, uh, well, you know, Terry, you're wrong. She said, the body is the most complex device in the known universe, of which the brain is a subset. And I think that, you know, this, this, uh, what Jim's point was right on, which is that the, the, the brain is monitoring everything. In fact, the insula is, has a complete representation of the viscera and is sending signals back and forth. And it, it's, it's a very, very complex uh, dance that is done, which uh, I think is, is actually, in some cases, may dominate. Uh, the, you know, the, the simple control models that we build of the body. Uh, yeah. But in any case, I, I think what you've done is magnificent in terms of setting up a system that allows you to put together pieces and, and, and be able to make predictions and then ultimately understands, you know, how the complexity of the body is actually organized. Hmm. 
Yeah, and, uh, and I think that there are things uh, that you could do if you sort of think of it in that way. Uh, I mean, but the, but the problem is always the data. Uh, I mean, could, is there somehow a, an ability to create a subsystem where you can measure all the inputs? uh and then see what the system is doing if you have that then you sort of have a well-defined subsystem that can be considered as a yeah as you know in, in in some ways uh it, it has been possible to do that say in the visual system mm -hmm. uh, you can record from si single neurons and mount arrays in the, in the retina and see how the information is encoded uh in the ganglion cells Hmm. And then how it's transformed in the lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus, and then it goes to V1 where it's transformed yet again, and then it's transformed up to V2. There are feedback hmm. connections you know, from, that Thomas showed, which are incredibly important, haven't been as well studied. But yes, we have input-output models of each one of those cortical areas in the visual cortex. So it is possible. Yeah. Uh, hmm. The farther you get in, the more complex it becomes in terms of understanding hmm. the signal. Uh, hmm. and, and, and there's a lot of information that... Uh, has to do with uh, the the uh, intracellular signals that uh, aren't mm -hmm. as well studied, uh, dendrites and so forth. So there's a, but uh, but yeah, we're we're trying to do that, and and that's that's really what neuroscientists have been trying to do for for decades and decades and decades. It's just more difficult because the things are yeah. ultra miniaturized and they're very heterogeneous. There are hundreds, yeah. many hundreds of different types of cells. The connectivity yeah. is very. Uh, we don't even know what the, the 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 degree of connectivity between all the different subtypes. So yeah, we we, we would love to have that uh, level of understanding. Daniela, you want to say some things? Um, yeah, I wanted to profit from the opportunity to have people with such a long experience in the field. Um, so Terrence, we talked at uh, December last year, maybe you remember in Vancouver. And um, so one thing that is haunting me in my comparably very short neuroscience kind of trajectory is. What if um, the cognitive notions, the notions of functions that readers happen to have, which have a long history in psychology and so forth, what if our semantic notions of the tasks that we use are incongruent with what the brain is computing? So, um, you know, whether we study the whole brain with like MRI type of techniques or single neurons or, or groups of neurons, I think it's uh, quite concerning to think that affect, attention, these types of things, they may just not cleanly map onto the brain. So that's also the topic of the new book by Bujaki. And yes. that's this kind of the second part of my question. If that is not the most kind of solid aspect about the brain that we can take for granted and build on, what are the, the aspects of knowledge that we have about the mammalian brain? that are most kind of solid and robust to build on? Okay, so first of all, you're, I, I completely agree that what we have right now is in, uh, an embarrassment of riches in the sense that we can collect data at a faster rate than anybody, you know, terabytes per experiment, you know, petabytes, and now we, we, you know, the rate limiting step is how you analyze it and the questions you ask. And unfortunately, we're saddled with a nomenclature that goes back to the mid, you know, to early 20th century. The, the, the words you use, you know, attention. What does that mean? There, it turns out that if you look into the psychology literature, it, it turns out that everybody who sets up an experiment is, is using that word in a different way. There is no attention. <laughs> there, there's this multiple mechanisms. In, it's a dynamical system that behaves in certain ways. And, 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 and those words that we use are very slippery and, 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 and have held us back. And so, yeah, but that sounds like a latent factor problem then. So let's say, let's say if you throw in a bunch of candidate tasks, let's say we can agree with experts on a, on a, on a battery of 20 tasks that we think are closest to what the brain does, maybe. And we say, even if um, the built on semantic notions, psychological principles, concepts that we do not think congruently map on the brain, then at least they will probe uh, these kind of unknown entities of processing that we don't know from different angles. So yes. that would lead to some form of a latent factor approach. So, you know, but that doesn't resolve the question because the latent factors will still be unnamed. Uh, you know that that's 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 a good starting point. I, and by the way, it is being done. It's it's a it's a very nice 
you know, brain machine interfaces have now been uh, developed to, to a point where they can be used to control robot arms. And uh, Dave Susilla did a really wonderful analysis uh, using autoencoders uh, and, and, and looking at the, uh, the patterns of activity in the motor cortex through an autoencoder and extracting out the latent variables in the middle. And he, and he was able then to map those onto the, uh, the, the arm motions in a much cleaner way than in this, just doing a linear regression. So, uh, so I think that is going to be uh, very revealing. Uh, and and uh, interpreting those uh, latent variables is, is, is where we will get beyond this, the simple names and, uh, and semantic, uh, semantics that we've had to work with for so long. I think I think that uh, you know you're you you put your finger on something which uh, is is missing right now, which is that uh, ultimately we will have a uh, you know the brain is a dynamical system, very high dimensional space, and I, I said this at the beginning of my talk, the properties of dynamics, of, of, of in fact statistics, of high dimensional spaces is something that is counterintuitive. Uh, you know, in fact, deep learning should not work. Uh, statisticians, uh, optimal control theorists, they, they told us that you're crazy. You, you have a model here with, you know, thousands of parameters and, it, it, you know, you're gonna get, you know, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna be overfitting, uh, you're gonna get caught in local minima and we just we were very naive. We went ahead and we didn't. You know, we managed to have enough data, and, and we didn't get caught in local minima because it turns out in high dimensional spaces there aren't any, <laughs> except when you get to the very bottom, uh, when you're doing gradient descent. And so, so what's happening now is that statisticians are, are jumping in, mathematicians, and and they're discovering properties of these high dimensional spaces, which are really totally unexpected and and. And, and I think that's the mathematics that will eventually lead us to the insights about how very high level representations in the cortex are, are used that uh, you know, have, have the ability to uh, form concepts, uh, language and thought. Uh, and it's, I, you know, it, it's gonna come through mathematics, through lots of recording and analysis of data using in, in these latent Factors that, that you're talking about are, are going to be the gateway. That's going to that's going to give us uh, an, an, an experimental uh, ex, uh, access to the, the brain states that are that are important for behavior. But still, what are the things that are most robust that we can rely best on that we already know about the brain to make forward in the direction you suggest? Uh, Let's see, let's see. I well, I, I'm going to pick up something else. I think that uh, you you actually had uh, a very important uh, insight. You know, most almost 99% uh, of all the uh, experiments. The only exception I know are people who study the hippocampus. But what they do is they they strap a monkey or a, a rat down, and then they have it. They train it up on a task, one task to do something, to press a button if they see something. And the problem is that it's very under constrained because the same neuron could be used for many, many other tasks. And so, you know, if, if, if you see that it responds to a visual stimulus, you say, ah, this is a visual neuron representing that stimulus. And uh, the, the fact is that if you have many tasks, you'll discover that the very same neuron is involved in, in many different tasks. And, and it's, again, it's high dimensional. Behavior is high dimensional and, and neurons have inputs that are very high dimensional, and so understanding how that is, is is how those maps come together, and how the different neuron, how this very same set of neurons is 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 participating in many different tasks. That's where we'll understand, you know, the the, the things that uh, we hope will you know will under, help us get to the bottom of how the brain is responsible for behavior. It's it's a very very it's a high dimensional problem, much higher than anybody imagined. Daniel, do you want to say something more about noise, qua noise? Oh, I think one man, one man, man's noise is another man's signal, and I, I completely agree with Jim there. 
Just All right. That. But now Daniel's going to say something. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I, I throw in my two cents on noise here. Um, so I think that noise is essential for cognition and for computation. Um, noise is a difficult term, of course, I acknowledge that and its relation to information. But um, I think that, uh, first of all, I mean, our world is full of uncertainty and animals have to deal with that uncertainty. They have to compute and update probability distributions all the time. They have to do inference on them. Uh, if they want to make decision making, then, uh, you know, um, in, in deep learning, we have stochastic gradient descent. We inject noise on purpose for good purposes, right? Because we want to get out of suboptimal solutions, for instance. Um, I think that animals are doing that all the time for decision making. Um, I, I think um, it's, a, it's a common observation that even if animals know what the rewarding option is in a two, simple two lever task, yeah, uh, lever task, um, that is with just uh, conditioned um, operand conditioning paradigm, they systematically, they, they randomly probe the other option all the time. Yeah, So um, they do inject noise on purpose, I think, um, all the time. And um, at the, um, and I also think that biology doesn't try to avoid that. I think that uh, probabilistic synaptic release in the cortex is one example. We know that synapses can do much better, but they do function probabilistically um, in, in neocortex. So I do think there's a big role for real stochasticity in the system, both at the computational, at the cognitive, and at the biological level. So, so you know, your, your point about the probabilistic releases is, uh, is very much similar to dropout in uh, deep learning. Uh, as a way of regularizing. In other words, uh, if you have too many uh, parameters, uh, if you if you if we've you know if you turn off uh, the, originally it was turning off the unit, but now uh, you you can uh, connect drop to uh, you 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 uh, you get better generalization. So so that's a good example where noise and, and you reduce the energy load, right? You don't have to have a, a release every time because that's expensive. Uh, but by the way, the uh, your example of, of, of lever pressing, uh, actually we know a, a little bit about that, and 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 uh, because uh, if your goal is to survive in the world, uh, it, you better not make the assumption that it's stationary. That is to say, uh, just because something worked today doesn't mean it's going to work tomorrow. Exactly. Yeah. So, so in fact, you 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 do want to do some exploration uh, just to, to test to see if anything has changed, because uh, that might be important for uh, changing your strategy or in, you know uh, trying trying to uh, optimize you know your future rewards. And and that's something that also comes out of temporal difference learning, which is a very popular model right now for dopamine neurons in the basal ganglia. Right, but in a deterministic certain world, you wouldn't need that, right? So you need it because uh, conditions are changing all the time, because you do not know you have right. to work with probability uh, distributions all the time in cognition. Right, right. and, and, th and that, that is the insight, is the world is probabilistic, and if you don't adapt to that distribution and that's changing, you know, you're, you're toast. And, and, uh, and by the way, uh, the, the evolution is all about doing that too, is, is that you, you, what you need is a just if every... Yeah. Every animal had the same genome, and you were monochromatic, monogenetic. You know, if the, the environment changes a little bit, your your again, your your species is gone. But by creating diversity, so that uh, if the if the conditions change, there will be some subset of the genome that is is able to adapt to that new niche, and then they will be able to propagate. Yeah, but that 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 is is an essential part of all of biology is, is of having. Probability, probabilistic distributions, and diversity. Okay, I'm inviting uh, Pyotr Farnachuk to uh, say something. Again, this is a little unwieldy that I have to kick people out without even telling them and then invite another person on because I'm only allowed to have four people. Yeah, you, actually, actually, I'm um, I'm close to bedtime, so I'm, I'm happy <laughs> to drop out again. Uh, Piotr, I invited you on. You have to accept, I think. I'll try again. Okay, we are pure. Can yeah. you hear me? Because, yes. Yeah, because I had some problems with the microphone. No, I, I think this is a great discussion, and especially when we were talking about noise. 
uh, I just heard of this meeting somebody somebody uh, talked about it that infants actually can can hear uh, sounds on the level almost of the of the thermal noise uh, and the point the, the point is exactly that I think our our brain and the system during the uh, both evolution and development in the individual is exactly picking up what how far from this noise you know which is not carrying any information we can get and and then how close we should be to this level of noise to actually save on energy and and all of the expenses and the other thing is obviously that we are if we are talking about from the analysis point of view about some other methods are talking about this is a background noise okay this is the something like this 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 is basically a semantics we are talking about that signal which we are interested in. okay so we are interested in the signal the rest might be background noise it doesn't mean that this is noise i actually was working and some of you know on using uh, stochastic models how the regressive models for analysis of of eeg in this case obviously uh, the, the the traditional stochastic approach is you are saying that that you are describing the system as the stochastic autoregressive model and then actually everything rest should be white noise obviously in eeg it's never white noise it's exactly that you can describe the part i i view it like this okay we are interested in this part which is stationary stochastic we can use it later even for granger causality or whatever but then what we leave out is obviously not a white noise it has the information and this information should be analyzed by different methods so so that that's the point that actually it, it's misleading well, it's, it's wonderful that you talk about EEG because that's something that we worked on quite extensively in the 90s. Uh, in fact, it was uh, independent component analysis that, that was uh, developed by Tony Bell in my lab, a postdoc, yeah. uh, that was, uh, has been extensively used, as you probably know, for analyzing EEG independent components. Right. But the, uh, one of the interesting things about ICA is that uh, it, it only works if the signals are not Gaussian. Right, <laughs> right. In other words, uh, it, you, there's no way you can d disentangle mixed signals if they're all Gaussian. Uh, you, ne you need to have uh, something that is, uh, 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 and, and in fact, uh, almost all the signals that carry information uh, are Laplacian that have long tails. Uh -huh. And that's perfect because that, that signal can be separated out beautifully with the ICA. And so it, it turns out to be a, 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 a generalization using higher order information uh, that you don't get from just the, the correlation, the second order moments. So, so that's, that's, a, that's a beautiful example of, of uh, you know, how you can go beyond uh, the sort of traditional spectral analysis, which again is based on correlation. Spectral analysis right. is not giving you higher order information. And, and, and it's all, the, the brain is all in, is in the business of higher order uh, analysis so here, here's another analogy i like to use uh it, 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 this is actually in the context of understanding how single neurons work by recording one at a time okay suppose that you had the task of looking at the world through a soda straw one pixel at a time right mm -hmm. how much progress do you think you're going to make uh, figuring out what's out there right the complexity of of uh, objects and uh, you know all the all the uh, the the, the things that we automatically uh, are able to parse out from the world, you know, uh, it, 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 it's, it's, but it's even worse because uh, the world is constantly moving and changing, which means that, it, it, you know, if you're looking at one pixel, it's constantly changing. So what are you going to get out of that? Uh, and, and so the information is in the population. That's where you've got to find it. And it's high order information, which means that you just can't use the traditional tools that have been used and by the way, I was really impressed, I've forgotten who, who gave the talk. It was uh, uh, De no, uh, Danilo Stock, uh -huh. D-O-Z. Uh, in, in any case, I, I, I think what he, what he outlined there is 
something that happens all the time, which is that certain fields get stuck in a certain way to analyze the data, you know, P less than 0.05. Yeah. I mean, that basically in psychology, you can't get a paper published unless you do that significance analysis. And, you know, uh, it, it's, it, it does have its use, but the point that he was making, which is that it doesn't, it's not going to help us to try to make sense of individuals. Uh, you know, there you, you're making a prediction, you know, that the, of, for an individual. And, the, and that's a different question from significance. But uh, Munar, did you have some more uh, questions asked? Uh, yeah, uh, I really like this discussion, and um, um, there is a, somehow a, almost a parallel discussion going on in the chat, which is uh, a bit amusing to see. There is somehow cross talk between them, but not always. Um, and uh, in the chat, we're talking about different types of models and models versus metaphors and so on, and and this uh, drives a little bit to my question, uh, which is. Um, uh, Many of these things that we're discussing now are uh, sort of quite fundamental. Uh, that they are sort of what approach should we use at all, and uh, do we even have the right uh, concepts or the right tools uh, to uh, to understand what learning is and what are the processes involved and so on. Uh, I want to put that a little bit in again for me as an outsider. The the sort of impression you you get as an outsider from these uh, enormous networks that exist. There, there's one in the EU and there's one in the US, both with $1 billion uh, each, mm -hmm. um, which which you, you somehow as an outsider would think that there would come something out of it, which is not just uh, sort of individual papers, but that is somehow a bigger picture of the brain as a whole um, and that uh, if on the limit, on the sort of level of understanding we have now, with the tools that we have now, with the concepts we have now, uh, to to produce something like that. Um, in my field, there are corresponding networks on the liver and so on, which have had similar ambitions and succeeded to some extent. Uh, and my question here is: Is there a strategy uh, at place for producing something like that? Something that is clearly beyond what individual researchers or, or collaborations can do, but that really requires this $1 billion. Right. So I, I can speak for uh, the Brain Initiative, which is the American uh, Brain mm -hmm. Project, because I was on the uh, NIH advisory panel, mm -hmm. which put together the uh, Brain 2025. And uh, <clears throat> that, that, was, that was specifically our goal. Our goal mm -hmm. was to try to uh, transform the, the neuroscience community in two different ways. One, by bringing in engineers who, who, who can build uh, probes and tools and techniques for analysis, data analysis, uh, that went way beyond what could be done with the, the technology that was being used. As I said, recording from one neuron at a time was, was basically the standard. You know, if you go back uh, to the 60s, right, that was a big advance, but uh, you know, the, the soda straw analogy means that you really need much larger populations. You need much more complex behavioral uh, tests. And okay, so where are, where are we? Okay, no, the second thing, the second thing, which is what you're bringing up, which is that the tradition in uh, neuroscience has been the R01, which is the single lab. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And they do have program projects, which is supposed to be for multiple labs, but Mm. But, but the vast majority of, of all of neuroscience is done with a single lab model where every boat is its own, own bottom, which means that mm. you, you have to be able to do all the tools and techniques. You have to be able to do all the analysis in your own lab. Mm. And, 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 and for when you're exploring, that's a really great way to do it because you can explore in many different directions. Many different labs can look at the problem differently, and that, that's great. But once you, once you have a sufficiently su – su su once you have a, a, a sufficiently – uh, powerful technology, then no single lab can actually use it anymore. <laughs> so you uh, you necessarily need to have uh, a consortia. You need to have uh, uh, ways of being able to uh, coordinate. And and that is what's happened. Actually, I, I was uh, there's an annual brain initiative meeting, and I have to say that it has delivered something that I thought would never happen, 
which is that the, the, first of all, the engineers have been embraced and, and, and the tools that are coming out have just exploded what we can do. We single cell genomic analysis, single neurons. We, we, we have, uh, in fact, I was on a methylation project that looked at the methylation uh, pattern of different uh, uh, neurons that distinguishes between different cell types. And the, and the other thing is that uh, there, there are these the large consortia now that have formed which, uh, and, and a good example of that, the early model was the Allen Institute for Brain Science. So this was uh, funded originally, I think, uh, for $100 million by uh, uh, Allen, you know, from Microsoft Fortune. And uh, what they did there was very interesting, was they started out with anatomy. They said, we've got to scale up instead mm -hmm. of each lab looking at one particular part of the brain and saying what the neurons look like or how the tract is between here. Let's do it on a larger scale. We're gonna mm -hmm. do all the tracts, we're gonna do all the neurons. Mm -hmm. And, but in order to do that, we have to scale up, which means that we have to optimize the tools and techniques. And so they, they basically you know, took things that had been put together by hand and used differently in different labs and weren't reproducible and basically optimized it to the point and automated it so that they can get very reproducible results and scale it up so they can do a whole brain. And, and so the atlases they put out are, are, are really very, very useful and a lot of people are using them. But then in mm -hmm. the second uh, 10 years, they've gone off, Christoph Koch was hired, one of a CNS person, um, and uh, he's a chief scientist. And so he said, look, we gotta do the same thing for brain activity. And so now what they have is what they call a brain observatory. So if you have a project that fits within the set of uh, constraints that they have, and it's, it's the visual cortex primarily. Uh, they, 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 they can record from different parts of the visual cortex with arbitrary stimuli. And if you have a, an interesting experiment to do, you can get time on it and you can go up there. You don't have to do the experiment yourself. They'll do it for you. But the mm -hmm. idea is so that you participate and you, you can see the data coming in, you can adjust it and so forth. And, and then, uh, you know that you can take that home and it becomes uh, as long as you're, you're going to make that a public property. Right. So that's you know, that's the other breakthrough is that up until recently, data never got out of the lab. Yeah. And yeah. I think I mean, data is, is, is certainly key to making such a thing happen. I mean, you need to measure all the, the relevant variables and the sufficient resolution and you need to make it sort of jointly available for Absolutely. a sufficiently large of people uh, and but but uh, but data in itself doesn't produce anything more than data so to say uh, uh, and and uh, for the for the goal I, I don't even know if it is a goal to to produce a really highly detailed model of the brain as a whole uh, that sort of functions and can do many things and that sort of incorporates most of this data or much of this data. Is there a strategy for that, for on the modeling side, so to say? Well, uh, you know, there, there are many, many uses for data. And one of them is to allow uh, people to uh, 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 analyze it with many different approaches. And, 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 and each, each approach is going to see something different in the data. So it's mm -hmm. just getting it out there is, is a, already a, a, an advance. Now, but the, the deeper question mm -hmm. you ask, which is the it, 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 so European uh, Human Brain Project was a different beast. Uh, Henry Markham, as you know, was the director, and he uh, was the one who had the, the concept and, and sold it to the European Union and a uh, you know, hundred a billion euro. Uh, mm -hmm. And and I think that uh, it was the goal was in fact to build a very detailed model of. The human brain. I mean, you know, down mm. to the last uh, ion channel, I think, you know. And uh, I, I think that, it, you know, it, it, that's an admirable goal in the sense that, uh, it, it, you know, you'd learn a lot along the way, which is what I mm. actually told a, a nature reporter. But mm. I think that uh, it may be you know, it may be that at the end of the day, you actually have a perfect model and you turn it on and, and then it uh, talks to you. You know, what have you learned? 
Well, I mean, uh, you know, brains can talk, so it's. But this it's, is but this is where data comes in again. I mean, if if and this is the sort of the strategy for the whole body level that we 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 sort of set out that you you sort of have this subdivision of labor for different aspects of the body, and each of these components that you put together needs to have been able to not only replicate data but but even but but predict data uh, a number of times and in fundamentally new directions for it to sort of be useful description of a component and then right. you want to, the same type of predictive ability on the on the so, whole so, yeah. right so i, I you know the, the, there's the, so i have two comments uh, mm -hmm. and 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 here here's i think the more important uh, comment no i'm not sure which is more important but in any case uh, Feynman once said that you don't fully understand something unless you build it and it works the same way that you thought it mm -hmm. would. Mm -hmm. And so I think the ultimate test of whether our brain models are any good mm -hmm. is if ultimately if we are able to reproduce and, and not just the function but the dysfunction when it goes wrong. Yep. And 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 it, it then it it, it it will reproduce the behavior and uh, the failure modes. That's yep. what I think we'll have progress and i think that's where ai yeah. is heading right now it's heading in the neural direction which is good you know because we can help yeah. them <laughs> now yeah. but the other the other uh, comment which is something that francis crick once told me uh, he was a colleague here for many years and we used to have tea every day at 3 30 when he would come to it and we had this wonderful scientific discussion and, and francis had this mind that just he just loved talking about science i mean you know we it, it was it was a golden period in my lab the 90s it was just the golden period we, you know ICA uh, dopamine neurons you know clay Reed and Peter Dayan. We, 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 we had a wonderful time but so he, I remember a T one day he uh, said Terry you know you build these models but you know you're taking them too seriously they're not an end in themselves and I, and I said well Francis what do you mean he said that the real purpose of a model is to design a killer experiment that you would have never thought of doing that mm -hmm. is going to give the game away, mm -hmm. right? In other words, mm -hmm. it's a way of, cre of creating uh, 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 insights into something yeah. that then can be tested. And it's really the yeah. experimental sure. Sure. test that will yeah. lead us to a better understanding. Yeah, and and uh, I mean, quite often, not always, but quite often, once you know which experiment to do and you have done it, and you have seen it through the eyes of the model, so you know sort of the interpretation that the model supports, then you are like, of course, it's like this. This is obvious. Uh, right. But before that, you sort of you didn't know which experiment to do, and even when you did the experiment, maybe you didn't know how to interpret. Maybe you had another interpretation. So I, I think this is sort of the ultimate goal, which is basically what Einstein said as well, that, I mean, if, 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 if you can't explain what you're doing and, and what you come up with to your grandmother, you haven't really understood it. Uh, so, I mean, that's the ultimate. The complexity is only a sort of sub-step. Once you have found the principles and really proven them, then, then you need to simplify them. Right, and, and those principles are very hard won, and uh, you know you can count them on one hand from what you know what we've known so far, and it's you know it's very different business from uh, physics, where you know you the principles from from the principles you can derive everything. Right? It's, yeah, biology yeah. is completely different, and it, 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 for the reason I gave earlier, which is diversity. Every electron is exactly the same. <laughs> it's like, you know, you can do the experiment anywhere and you'll have the same electron uh, in terms of the result you're going to get. And, and, and there's no two animals that are the same. There's no two neurons that are the same. So you, 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 we, we need a very different theoretical conceptual framework to deal with that. And we're, we're, get, we're getting there. I, and I think this, these high dimensional space, mathematics on high dimensional spaces, I think, will be very important. For, yeah. <laughs> If I may comment, yeah, I agree completely about it. I actually, you know, I have a degree in physics, but exactly I went into biology and other thing because physics were too bored. Yeah, <laughs> everything was the same. But the, uh, no, I think the one thing which which is also which uh, I agree, I think, with Georgi Bushaki, who was talking about it, that that the uh, the approach which we actually now follow is too much 
after the physics and engineering. And even what Gunnar was mentioning, it means that we are talking about inputs, outputs, boxes in between. And, uh, I, you know, like, like Georgie was talking about it at some point, that we actually, bra our brain is the complex system, which actually it would be probably uh, uh, too simplified to actually say that there are some subunits which are connected by inputs and outputs and we can follow and analyze them separately. It's exactly as you said, you have to have a very large, uh, you know, data and which is all everything. And basically it should be the whole body because we should treat it as a very densely connected complex system, which actually it's it's difficult if you are thinking about network even or something like this. It would be very difficult to say where is the input to this part of the network and where is output from this part of the network. So, I, I, by the way, I love Yuri Bujaki's book. I, I yeah. taught in my graduate class and I completely agree with him, you know, almost 100%, not entirely. But what the, 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 the punchline, then this gets to your point about um, inputs and outputs. Yeah. The thing that really is was for so long was missing. Uh, you know, we turn monkeys into uh, reflexes by giving them tasks where they have a stimulus mm -hmm. and they have an output. Now, you know that that's that allows you to analyze and correlate activity with the uh, different parts of the task. The trouble is that under normal conditions, animals uh, generate behavior on their own. They they don't wait for a stimulus to come in. They, they, they're, they're, uh, the, the brain is an active even when there's no stimulus, when you're lying yeah. in your bed in the dark, you know, and your thoughts are going through your head. That is the essence of the brain. And uh, until we have the tools for being able to get to the, you know, the generators and what, what they're, uh, how, how that, that information is flowing through the brain, and what's, mm -hmm. what is generating it, where is it coming from? That's, that's really where we're going to make progress. And yeah. Yeah. But Inside I would out. say that, that even, you know, if you are we are criticizing physics, <laughs> but from the point of view of, of you know, complex theory and the, the things which actually, you know, in the system dynamics when physics are actually working on, it's exactly not like this. So it means it's, we are not in Newton or even Galileo type of the physics. We are talking also about the physics, which are actually talking about emerging properties in complex systems. And even if we, we may model actually simply uh, simple materials and other things, assuming that they are same, but we have a very big difficulty, and this is a problem actually in industry and everywhere, when you are trying to create more complex materials, which are actually with the kind of very small additions of, of different things, all electronics works on this and the other things. And if we are going deeper and deeper into it, we are starting to see that exactly when we input a more of diversity, into the systems. We have to use different tools. And these are basically the tools from complex theory and, and, and this kind of the tools. And this is applicable, I think, to, to our thinking about the brain and even the whole body, instead of exactly thinking about this kind of the simple things that we have the input, we have a stimulus, okay? And there is the response of the stimulus and the, based on the old physics, I would say, we are saying, okay, we want to repeat it. As you said, we are doing the same with this monkey. Okay, we train them to do the same. And even, you know, the, the whole thing when I was working in epilepsy research in clinical application, the point was that actually epilepsy is, is, is the nice thing for, for people who are talking about individual differences. Because the point is that you cannot actually do a group analysis. And the whole point of difficulty of doing it in animals is you have clones, okay? You have animals, mice, which are clones. They are all almost the same. And in this case, that was early uh, design like this because we, we wanted to actually repeat this, I would say, elementary physics that we want to have the system which we know that it should behave exactly the same. But when you go into real, not only human, but normally 
animal behavior, it's not like this. So you should actually look into it differently. You, you might look, and that's why I like Bushaki approach, because you are looking about to it that you have your own sort of patterns and other things, and we can call it memory patterns. We can call it another things, which are already in our brain. And then they are actually combined with the environment and what is happening in the environment, and then we have the reaction. So this is not a simple kind of input-output reaction. That's uh, and that that's exactly the difficulty even to what Gunnar uh, was suggesting uh, dividing, for example, brain into the parts. I would say that was the old way of looking into brain, like you know, separately on visual cortex, auditory cortex, and other thing. We know that diseases there are diseases where people are actually uh, seeing colors when they hear sounds. Okay, mm -hmm. so in this case, uh, you have you have basically the the connection between these two systems, which which probably are always connected, but most of the people during development actually separated them somehow. Uh, but but uh, so so I would say this is this needs a different type of modeling, not this kind of engineering approach. Input, you know, what happened in the box to create this out. But 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 you still do have that type of input output. I mean, you can consider individual cells, and you can sort of stimulate a cell and see what it's doing. I mean, a cell is uh, in that sense. Uh, That's a right. System. But, but but in the brain and in the body, you don't have the cells uh, uh, isolated. So, the, so, here's, so, here's so even if if the cell isolated cell will do it, if you do it in the network, that that would be different, different output. If you have the same cell. Actually connected with other, with other sure, cells. Sure. Yeah, that but that's would part of the input. What cell. other cells are well, doing? No, no, the, it, it's more complicated than that because yeah, you, you know, if if you take two cells that you know come from the same part of the brain, yeah. tissue culture under the same conditions, you stimulate them the same way, you don't get the same response. No cells. No, sure, no. It, sure. It, it, it's like you know, and and it's because each cell has is self-regulating inside and it's it's been responding to inputs you know uh if hormones uh differently and that means that it's on a different trajectory uh in, in this very high dimensional space of what the cell can do what or be it's it's a, a like a cloud of pr uh, pr properties that they have mm -hmm. not not just the same and for epilepsy uh, i've actually worked with several people uh, analyzing epilepsy data sid cash at mgh in particular uh mm -hmm. at ecog and uh, there are many, many different types of epilepsy, and there's no two patients that have the same no. exactly <laughs> kind. And, and it, 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 you know, it's true of mental disorders. Schizophrenia is not a single disease mental disorder; it's a spectrum of diseases. And you know, and and, and there's overlap with bipolar, and there's overlap with uh, depression and, and autism. And so, you know, it's uh, it's it's very, very uh, on on. Uh, it, 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 you, you, it's 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 difficult to put joints on this uh, system that we have we call the brain. It's yeah. it's very, uh, you know, has so many different possible states. But I would say even on this level of the cell, I agree completely that if you you might actually have the situation when you will artificially create the uh, the environment for the cell that mm -hmm. it will repeat itself. Even uh, we are not talking that not every cell is the same. I, I am rather talking about it that actually if you connect the cells into network and a very large network, especially like the brain, when there are all of these this interactions, not only electrical, but also chemical and, and everything, in the sense you it no longer behave like this individual cell and even if uh, it, it behaves already as a part of the large complex system and this large complex system doesn't respond even to the same stimuli in the same way because the, the, the system is never the system the system is actually never in the same resting state even what yeah, we sure, are calling a, a resting state is not Never the, the same. So even if you put the same stimulus to the same kind of the complex system, it will respond differently because it was actually starting from different 
resting state. And we have this problem with brain, obviously, and a lot of biological things. So I can, I can, give, I can give an example of that. So uh, I'm collaborating with John Reynolds here, who works on marmosets, visual cortex. And we have a paper that will be coming out soon in Nature. Uh, so it, you know, it's been known for decades and decades. And Bujaki is one of the world's leading experts on brain oscillators. Right. Mm -hmm. So th these are coherent patterns of activity where cells are firing, and uh, you know if, if you know you you wonder, you know why and uh, and it's it's very controversial in the field about whether th they have uh, are, are important at all for brain function or computation. A lot of ideas, but uh, very hard to prove anything. So uh, we we did an experiment, uh, and this came out of work that I had been doing with a postdoc. Uh, Lyle Muller analyzing populations of you know, recordings from ECOG from humans. Mm -hmm. uh, we had we had noticed that during sleep spindles that there were circular traveling waves. The 10 to 14 hertz uh, sleep spindles lasted for a few seconds that were repeating over and over again. And and this is uh, we we know that the sleep spindles are important for consolidating memory. But you know we how how do you make progress? And so. It turns out that you, in the awake animal, you have uh, waves too. You have waves traveling through the cortex, and you see these in arrays, with the Utah array, a uh, hundred electrodes. It just covers uh, a part, one area called MT. And so what we did is we had an experiment where the monkey had to look at a weak stimulus, where it was getting it right half the time, right? So it was right at the level of perception, of of being able to, uh, you know react within a, a brief period of time. And then we looked at the phase of the traveling wave. And it turns out you could predict with very high accuracy from the phase of the traveling wave, whether or not the monkey was going to press the button to see, report that it was able to see the stimulus. And mm -hmm. so what this means is that these traveling waves have behavioral consequences for mm -hmm. how the neurons are responding to the stimulus. So, uh, so it, 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 and it turns out every single oscillation that has been looked at, uh, at uh, for example, gamma oscillation, 30 to 80 hertz, or the theta oscillation in the hippocampus, they're all traveling waves. And in the hippocampus, the theta goes from dorsal to ventral, you know, four to eight hertz. So it, that immediately tells us that this whole idea of thinking about the neurons as being independent of each other, you know, stochastically independent isn't making any sense because of the fact that they're spatially organized. And that is a very different picture uh, of how the brain organizes activity than the ones that we have right now. And we, we don't even know how to think about this. Yeah. But, well, I think that the, there are two uh, sides to this. I mean, one is uh, the, the fundamental assumption that if you would be able to exactly control the cell, individual cell to have the exact same inputs as it has in the network, whether it would behave the same. I, I would guess that everybody agrees that in principle that's okay, even though it's a very hard experiment to, to do. Uh, and uh, I think that um, um, just because it is like that doesn't mean that the best course of action is to fully understand each cell type before you start to aggregate things to the big picture. This is uh, this is sort of the bottom-up approach, which I think has many limitations, uh, even though the bottom layer should, of course, be there in data analysis and so on. Uh, you need to have the the middle out approach where you sort of construct uh, the behavior on a somehow resolution and then you can fill in the details and you can sort of look at the, the, the top behavior. Uh, and I think that if you do that, then it might very well be so that individual cells are not that important to understand. You just need to understand sort of how a cell works and then you study the networks because it's in the networks that the behaviors that you're interested in uh, happen. Um, and I think that that um, this this thing that you talked about of stochasticity and variability that that you that you if you do the same experiment twice or you study this this uh, another cell which is just next to it it will behave differently. Uh, this is where it's so important to design time series experiments uh, because time series experiments allows you to have an n equals one paradigm. Uh, where you basically, uh, either for an individual patient or for an individual cell or for an individual component of whatever it is, if you have a time series for it, you can develop a model uh, based on just the beginning of the time series 
and then you can have a, a model that is specific for that little system. And then you can use the rest of the time series for validating that model. And this is possible even though uh, a neighboring subsystem or, or another cell will, will be, or, or a, another patient will be different. Uh, so, so you don't have to sort of do averages over many cells, but you can actually do individual models for each uh, example, each copy that you have of the system that you're studying. Yeah, no, the, 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 the averaging is exactly the wrong thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you, you're absolutely right. You have to look at the individuals sell uh, over a long time yes uh, and you also have to be uh, very clever so so here, here here's uh, something that is giving us a clue every time we've looked uh at, with finer and finer methods at individual cells what we have found is that uh nature is not just averaging what you know that the details really are important and uh, we, we, we stumbled on something a couple of years ago. So synaptic plasticity, we know is very important for learning and memory. And we have, we have various mechanisms. There's Hebbian plasticity, spike time dependent plasticity, homeostatic plasticity. And uh, what nobody could figure out is what's the accuracy? What is the precision of plasticity? And in, in part it's because, you know, uh, you can't do the same experiment on the same synapse over and over again because it's changing. Yep. So you, you need to have some way of being able to look at uh, a controlled experiment. And so we stumbled on it, which was uh, a reconstruction of, uh, of a hippocampal CA1 uh, neuropil. And this is with Kristen Harris. Uh, and, and she's the master at uh, EM reconstruction. So we did a complete reconstruction, a very dense, of all the neurons, uh, of actually dendritic uh, synapses and dendrite, dendrites and astrocytes in this one little, you know, five by six by six cubic micron piece of cortex. We noticed that occasionally when an axon went by a dendrite, it would form two synapses on the same dendrite, same axon, same dendrite. Now all, all of the models and all of the experimental data tells us that the change in synaptic strength depends on two variables. One, the pattern of spikes on the input and the membrane potential on the outside. So some function, not very complex nonlinear function of the time history. Okay, so here's the ideal control experiment. Same input, same spikes coming in, same because they were within a few microns, so the same membrane potential, right? Now, it turns out that the size of the synapse has been shown to be very accurately proportional to the strength of the synapse. So all we have to do is reconstruct the, the postsynaptic spine, it turns out, the volume. And lo and behold, if you if you look at the pairs and plot them against each other, they form they fall on a straight line with very sp mm -hmm. small error. And mm -hmm. a CV of you know 0.016 or something, which mm -hmm. which which is telling us that whatever the synaptic plasticity mechanism is, it's incredibly accurate and precise, despite the fact that we know that there's a lot of probabilistic release and yes. there's a molecular variability and so forth. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but so that, that's, that tells us that it must be important yeah. Yeah. that but, uh, such, but, such uh, lengths in order to get such accuracy. Yeah, and uh, and I think that uh, this is an example of uh, of a thing that appeared in the chat some 15 minutes ago or something like this, that, that even though noise appears on a smaller level, uh, uh, there are lots and lots of control systems in biology, which means that you don't have to take all of that individual component noise and just add it together. But 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 because of the control systems, certain features like like glucose levels in the blood or temperature, and I mean there, there are many features uh, 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 that that are highly controlled, which means that there are very noisy components in the control system. But but you don't really have to consider them too much because the control system will make sure that you have this very nice input output or very nice homeostasis or something like this. Yeah, no, th th there's no doubt that, that, you, that you have to have those in order to be able to remain stable. Uh, by the way, I, I once had a, a postdoc who did a really interesting project, which is, uh, it turns out hormones do not just go up and down slowly. I mean, there are some, but it turns out that a lot of them are pulsatile. Yeah, for sure. And, 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 and it's not at a regular frequency. It's not like, you know, uh, a sine wave or anything. It's uh, 
irregular and it changes frequency of, of day and night and so mm -hmm. forth. And, and it, it, you know, we, we, we did some mathematical analysis to try to understand, you know, if we could figure out the, you know, what was the purpose of that. But, but it occurred to me that uh, there's, you know, the, 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 the system needs variability, mm -hmm. right? In other words, variability may be a part of the, the actual uh, design feature yeah. Maybe it's for calibration or something. You know, you, you go up and down, and then you see how the cell responds to the to the yeah. pulse. No, yeah. actually, as I mentioned before, you can you can actually think about some of the noise which we are seeing as the result of it's basically the chaotic uh, state of the some very deterministic maybe even system. The point is that actually, if we are thinking about how uh, well think about the uh, system in the phase space once again going back to dynamical systems how how make the system to actually respond very well to small uh, or very range of the stimuli you actually have to have this kind of the underlying seems to be chaotic noise in the because otherwise if you are thinking about nonlinear systems who are in stable you know, uh, cycles, they are actually difficult to throw out fr from this cycle. You, you need to have a system which is almost on the border of instability. And, and this one is actually looking like noise. And to create such system, you usually have to underlying components, as you said, which on the level, when you are looking into each single component of the system, it will be very noisy. But then when you are looking into interacting components of the system, they will settle to certain states. But once again, they will be relatively easy to get to get to, to another state on the small stimulus. So actually, nature seems to actually make it right in the sense that exactly this kind of the system which are designed like, like uh, animals uh, to, to respond to, to something, they are exactly, they have this underlying noise and this unstable systems which are able to. It's to a, I wouldn't call it noise, but I, there are two really nice examples. Yeah, yeah I wouldn't call it <laughs> One of them is the heart. So the heart, if you look at beat by beat intervals, it's irregular. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Unless, unless you have heart disease. It turns right. out that when it becomes regular, your heart's gonna fail. Yeah, so, the, the same in epilepsy. Obviously, the pathology is when you are actually get over synchronized and very regular kind of the 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 the, the brain activity. That's yeah, and, very and, pathological. And, uh, okay, brain. I mentioned brain oscillations before. It's it's unfortunate that that is used. Uh, it gives you the impression that first of all it's synchronous, which it's not across yeah, it's, the neurons, and number two, that the intervals are the same. It turns yeah. out it's very broadband, like uh, gamma is 30 to 80. Yeah. Mm. And it, what it means is that, you know, from cycle to cycle, the, the interval is changing. Yeah. And and that, you know, that that's, uh, I think, the rule. I mean, very rare do you get something that is a perfect uh, oscillator. It's no, very, it's usually pathological. If it is. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, I mean this type of this type of noise is, is sometimes also useful. I mean there are there are there are many systems, both in biology and in in engineering, which are designed to be unstable. Um, right. So so uh, the bacteria, for instance, that are so small that they can't sense the gradient can anyway because because they are they, their body is so small that that they 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 cannot sense the gradient because it's too much noise. They move in a random way. Uh, in all directions, uh, because they they can't. That's the only way they can sense the gradient by Super sort of taxes. moving randomly. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, you 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 construct airplanes uh, out of uh, uh, stable uh, stable regimes um, because that makes them faster to to navigate. It it means that they are uh, they are more agile, so to say, and uh, and so on. So I think um, uh, I mean. This whole thing of understanding stability, uh, this is somehow what life is, is not. Life is somehow, by definition, energy flow, flowing through a system to keep it out of stability. And it's the, in this place or out of stability that you somehow have the thing going on. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. By, by, by the way, there's, there's another concept of a robustness, which is a very important one. Uh, it, it is possible to use control theory to go outside of the, 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 the range that uh, a human can control. So fighter jets are, are not being flown by the, 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 the pilot, uh, except uh, you know, to, to give it commands because uh, it, it's very it's in an unstable part of the control model of, of you know the, this, of all of the the problems that uh, are going to occur at very very fast time scales so it, you know you, you you to get the best efficiency you, you you push yourself into areas that are not robust where things yeah. can break down and that's yeah. what that's probably what's going on with epilepsy with a lot of uh, mental disorders where things that you know have been stabilized went went too too far too close and uh, over the over the edge okay so I think we've gone over the edge of time here and <laughs> to, to wrap this up uh, thanking yeah. everyone who spoke and uh, for the late discussion which was very fascinating and we had a lot of people actually hung on till the end here and uh, we'll uh, talk again soon I hope okay uh, thanks thanks Bill. Thanks. Sam, you did a great Excellent. job. This has been a great uh, workshop. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. really great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nice to see you, Bill. <laughs> nice seeing everyone. Super interesting.